can tape the meeting, and people who weren't able to, to uh, be here tonight can watch it later. Um, and I'm assuming the city will also uh, replay it on the, on, on the television channel and make it available on the website. Um, I, this class is going to be given, as the one was last Saturday for the general public, this class is going to be given by Terry Rivasplata, a very distinguished expert on CEQA and general plans. Um, Terry was co-author of several previous editions of the state's general plan guidelines. Um, he was deputy director of the governor's office of planning and research before he joined ICF. And um, he's received a num number of awards. He's co-author of the new edition of the CEQA desk book that's going to be published later this year by Solano Press. And for anyone who was here uh, for the meeting on Saturday, uh, he gave an excellent pres general presentation on CEQA. And looking for we're very lucky to have him here for free. There we go. <laughs> who says there's no such thing as a free lunch, huh? Yeah. OK, so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about CEQA tonight. Um, I've changed the presentation from what was on Saturday. So we'll start off with kind of an overview of CEQA. But then we'll talk more about how CEQA applies to, uh, to some of the things that the BBKAG is interested in. Uh, I thought what we could do is, uh, if you have questions, just raise your hand. And I think Valerie will have a, a um, microphone. And she'll give you the microphone so we can get it on tape. But as we roll along, feel free to ask questions. Uh, that's all part of the presentation, so um, I guess we'll get started. So the uh, first thing is I had uh, CEQA 25 words or less. Uh, basically, it's from 1970. That's when it was enacted. Uh, the person who signed it was actually Ronald Reagan. Uh, the man who said, if you've seen one redwood tree, you've seen them all, actually signed CEQA. And at the time he signed it, it was quite a different law than we know today. It was originally intended to apply only to public projects. The idea being that when an agency undertook one of its own projects that it was going to approve or considering approving, that it had to do an environmental analysis, uh, had to identify any potential significant impacts, and then go about attempting to mitigate those impacts. Uh, in 1972, though, there was a lawsuit in Mono County uh, wherein the California Supreme Court held that when CEQA said, when CEQA talked about public agency approvals, they meant all approvals, all discretionary approvals by public agencies, not just the public agency's own projects, but also private projects that public agencies are considering. So things like zone changes and subdivisions and uh, condominium projects and uh, general plan amendments, all those things suddenly came under the umbrella of CEQA. And so the law that Ronald Reagan signed intending only to have it apply to, to public agencies suddenly applied to all sorts of things that public agencies were approving. So it ended up covering literally every year thousands and thousands of projects around the state. Uh, it was enacted back in 1970, has not been seriously updated since then. Uh, and so some parts of it are almost, uh, almost quaint uh, in the way that they talk about things. They talk about uh, you know, making sure that uh, man is in harmony with the environment and things like that, things left over from the, the ecology movement of the late 60s. So you find kind of funny, quaint language there in CEQA itself. Uh, it has never been updated to include standards, for example. You know, many, many laws have particular standards that you have to meet. Uh, it's never been uh, updated to include clear thresholds that indicate whether or not a project is, has a significant impact. Uh, it's never been updated to, um, you know, to mandate that you undertake particular methods of study. It doesn't do any of that. It's essentially just a, a process that agencies have to go through to look at things, to see whether or not there may be an impact, disclose what they find, uh, and then consider this project and either approve it or deny it, uh, and then go on from there. So its primary purpose is disclosure and then also mitigation. It requires that agencies disclose what they find, and it also requires that they go about mitigating any impacts that they might find to the extent that's feasible. Uh, I put here it's a magnet for land use litigation. Uh, if you look at the court cases that uh, relate to land use uh, questions, every year there's probably, oh, maybe 30 court cases that come out of the, the California Court of Appeal that are actually published and made precedent. And of those, probably 25, 26, 27, most of them, relate to CEQA in some way. So CEQA is used as the primary method of 
uh, attempting to stop or slow uh, projects. And it really is the, the, the main vessel by which people use, uh, or people undertake land use litigation. You hardly ever see any litigation against a city or county over a zone change uh, without it also involving uh, CEQA. Let's see, next, oh, there we go. So CEQA's guiding policies, uh, as I mentioned, it's disclosure to decision makers, to the public, to other agencies, letting them know what this project might do uh, with regards to the environment. Uh, identifying ways to avoid or reduce environmental damage, in other words, the mitigation measures that people talk about. And then um, disclosing, oops, sorry about that, disclosing to the public why the agency has approved projects. So it kind of provides a, a public uh, disclosure of the agency taking responsibility for its decisions. And then it uh, enhances public part participation by offering a number of opportunities for the public to weigh in on the environmental process. Uh, through the notice of preparation, which uh, has already passed now for the, the Baylands project, but through uh, commenting on the draft environmental impact report, uh, through uh, taking part in any planning commission meetings that there might be, taking part in any city council meetings that there might be on the project, commenting on the final environmental impact report, all of those various opportunities that people have to weigh in on the project. And then it fosters this interagency coordination. Uh, before CEQA, agencies really didn't have to talk to one another before they uh, considered a project for approval. But with CEQA, uh, when a draft environmental impact report is written, it has to be sent to other agencies for them to review and consider and offer the, the uh, lead agency, what we call the lead agency, their opinions on the project. Now, what, what are our issues with this project? What do we think uh, you might consider as mitigation measure? Uh, do we have some alternatives that we as other agencies think you should look at uh, as the lead agency? So it offers an opportunity for these other agencies to actually weigh in on the project and its potential environmental impacts in a way that didn't exist before, didn't exist before CEQA. So uh, what CEQA is and what it isn't, uh, CEQA is basically a project, or a process, I should say, a process that analyzes a project. Uh, it's not a permit. So it's not something that's going to approve or deny a project. It's simply a process for going through this disclosure and identifying mitigation measures. It does require mitigation to occur, uh, but it doesn't set any standards partic in particular the project has to meet. It simply lays out this process uh, that you have to go through. Uh, it doesn't uh, prescribe any acceptable levels of risk. It doesn't specify regulations that projects have to follow. Uh, but at the same time, it doesn't get in the way of regulations that agencies uh, may place on a project. A project that would be subject to particular regulations is going to be subject to those regulations, seek or not. Those are always going to apply. So it doesn't get in the way, but at the same time, it doesn't specify the regulations. And then it doesn't prescribe any study methods. So it kind of leaves it up to the lead agency and to the responsible agencies and to the public uh, to kind of come to an agreement that the lead agency is comfortable with as to what study methods are going to be used to determine whether or not a project might have a significant impact. And then it places primary responsibility for the whole process in the hands of the lead agency, who we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, and it's enforced through litigation. There's no CEQA police. So there's nobody looking over the shoulder of the lead agency to make sure that they're doing things right. Uh, when the law was signed and ever since then, uh, it's essentially intended to be enforced through litigation. Most cases, it's uh, citizens or residents who are bringing the litigation. Every once in a while, it may be another public agency bringing litigation. And then more rarely, uh, it may even be an economic competitor uh, against a project who brings litigation. There's been some cases where uh, uh, hazardous waste sites, curiously, hazardous waste site being uh, proposed in one location that had a, a competing hazardous waste site that sued the agency trying to uh, overturn the approval of their, their competitor. So you see uh, litigation as a means of enforcing it. Question or comment? You, you said there aren't any standards, but in the area of traffic, if, you, if, a, if a project re sorry, requires there. that there be traffic control measures, that would be considered a standard. You said there weren't any standards, but in the area of traffic, if a project causes, and the projects perhaps around it, they all cause an intersection to fall to level F, then that project, I, I thought, wouldn't be able to be approved unless it, somebody made a finding of, of overriding consideration. So to me, that's a standard. And so right. I guess I, that seems to me to, to contradict what you said. So right, yeah, and that, but that's not a CEQA standard. 
uh, some si it depends on what the city has decided is going to be its threshold or its standard. So CEQA didn't set that, didn't say that level of service F or level of service D or E uh, means that this is going to have a significant impact. In fact, there are some cities, City of San Jose, for example, within uh, the, the central business district of the City of San Jose, they have no traffic standard at all. So you could have a project that has level of service F uh, once, it's, you know, once it's built at downtown San Jose, and that wouldn't trigger an EIR. So CEQA itself doesn't set any standards, but it provides kind of a framework for agencies, the lead agency, uh, to say, well, you know, we think that traffic shouldn't get any worse than level of service C, so we're going to set that as our standard. So it, it creates this process, and it offers them a framework to set their standards, but it itself, if you read through CEQA, you can't find anything in there. Now, it does have something called Appendix G, which is the uh, CEQA checklist, the initial study checklist. And Appendix uh, G consists of, uh, set, I guess, about 17 sets of resource issues and some questions within each one of those resource issues. And the questions, Appendix G, I should start off with, Appendix G is uh, a model checklist. So it's offered as kind of an example of how an agency can go about analyzing potential impacts. And some people have taken those questions that are in Appendix G as kind of being CEQA standards, but they're not. They're simply questions that are offered as a model of how you might go about doing this. But CEQA itself, as I say, doesn't really have any standards. It promotes the use of standards, but doesn't really set any itself. It's kind of unusual. Yes? Dana. Hi. Um, I guess we would expect um, environmental consultants to be more cognizant of standards, and you're saying not prescribing study methods. We know that, like, the federal government will set certain regulations, you have to use, um, you know, search certain EPA tests to, exactly. to understand right. something. So I guess I'm disturbed that if there is knowledge about a better study technique or a better way to gain information, mm -hmm. you can declare that it's not complete, but what you're saying is you can't, you d aren't, wouldn't necessarily prescribe the method in order to go about completing the information that's necessary to make these kinds of um, choices. So um, I, I guess the public has learned what the minimum standards are using what the e federal and state EPA mm -hmm. require, um, but you're saying that of all the knowledge and you know contemporary science that you have in an um, EIR corporation or a, um, you know, uh, um, you, you're, we can't expect that you would give us the best possible laws like REACH or um, one of the things in, in our town is we would like to um, uh, respond to um, um, a different standard mm -hmm. than the lowest minimum standard we can have for cleaning up our baylands. And so I guess what I'm asking is, are you kind of pre-telling us that we aren't going to get the, the Cadillac knowledge of what we need to know in order to, to do the best cleanup for the baylands? Right. You may not, to be honest, you may not as part of the CEQA document. Uh, that's because CEQA, again, isn't a permit. It's just a process of offering information. And at this point, what we're looking at is a relatively general project. We still don't have the remedial action plans. We still don't have a lot of parts of the project developed yet. And so as the CEQA process that we'll talk about later, what we're working on right now, what the city, when I say we, I mean the city. I'm kind of stepping in, into their shoes. What the city is working on right now is a program EIR that's going to take a relatively broad look at what's going on out there. Uh, it's going to provide uh, the best information that it can. It good, has to make a good faith effort at uh, providing information. Uh, even though there are no standards or study methods laid out in CEQA, from a practical point of view, just as you say, there are going to be at least what, what the um, DTSC and what uh, you know, uh, Regional Water Quality Control Board and what other agencies may, may demand. They're going to be at least that good. Um, but they're going to be done at a relatively general level at this point in time because we don't have enough information about what's going on out there. However, as we'll talk about later, once this 
proceeds down the permitting path, assuming that the city approves this project. Uh, when DTSC looks at it, they'll have more information. They'll be required to do additional CEQA disclosure. Uh, when the um, Department of Toxic Substances Control looks at it, uh, they may also have additional information. They'll be required to do additional CEQA disclosure. And so the process doesn't end. As I think I may even have a slide coming up in a little while. process doesn't end with the program EIR. It's essentially just starting. That's just sort of the foundation for tiering additional analyses on top of. And the assumption under CEQA is as you know more about the project, uh, more information comes forth. Uh, if you identify new significant impacts as a re result of that information, or as a result of um, even better definition of the project, or even uh, changes to the project, refinements to the project, uh, that then additional CEQA documents have to be done too. So that that's disclosed and that the current decision makers, not today's lead agency, but the later responsible agencies, they'll have even better information than the lead agency did because there's more information available. Uh, you had a question, and Valerie will be coming over with the microphone in just a second. So we'll get it uh, taped for posterity. Here we go. Well, I, I think the problem with the, that, you know, maybe some people who are environmentalists worry about, or even people interested in the impacts in other areas might worry about is, is the, the program project ERs can be sort of a shell game. You know, we've had a, uh, a concept plan that's been in effect on this project since 2005, 2006. And it is more detailed. But when you consider levels of detail, and I understood what you were saying, but I think what we're, what we would like to try to do by virtue of comments to the EIR in this case, the project ER, is make sure that there aren't holes as big as a truck to, through which to, to drive impacts that are not going to be mitigated. And I think that there is there's concern also in the area of toxics because we would like things to be a little more secure than even the DTSC would require. Mm -hmm. And it, it almost sounds as though, though you know, you're, you're saying, truthfully, we don't, you won't necessarily get the best, the best result from this. It's like when you say study methods are not prescribed. So then maybe could we use phrenology of the developer's family to figure out what the traffic's going to be? I mean, it could be absurd that the way you put it, it sounds like you could use anything. Oh, no, not at all. No, all I'm saying is that CEQA itself doesn't prescribe any study methods. But study methods are prescribed more commonly through professional practice, uh, through the standards of other agencies, through the standards of the lead agency. That's what, that's what essentially ends up defining how we go about doing the studies. For example, the Air District, Air Quality District, they have uh, their CEQA guidelines, and their CEQA guidelines lay out what you're supposed to use, what sort of air quality model is... is uh, Requ required, that sort of thing. And even though those aren't um, mandates, because CEQA requires that you do the, uh, provide a best, a good faith effort at disclosure, they essentially do become required. They're not technically required, but because they're the, the Air District, for example, is the expert in this area, an agency really is required to do that. Hasn't, hasn't CEQA been, been changed or sort of, you could say, revised by case law? I know that case, case law is being reflected in the presentation. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. It certainly is. Yeah. Uh, CEQA has changed, well, not changed, interpreted every year by case law. And there's anywhere between 25 to 28 cases that come down every year. Uh, one of the odd things about CEQA is just we have some breaks in the courts. There's several different district appellate courts around the state. And in some parts of the state, as we'll talk about later when we get to uh, baseline, there is a distinct split between these courts. In Southern California, the courts are saying one thing. In Northern California, the courts are saying something else. So the bottom line is that the, the case law isn't always consistent. But to the extent that it is, yeah, it's being reflected in here. And there's court case law that uh, you know indicates that you have to do a good faith effort. And that means disclosing all of the facts that are available. So if an agency, for example, um, has, has uh, conflicting information that comes in during this, the process of preparing an EIR, it needs to make all of that available to the public. It doesn't have to reconcile the differences between expert opinion or something like that, but it has to provide both sides. If it's getting two sides to an issue, it has to present both of those sides in the EIR. And if the agency decides to make conclusions 
Uh, it has to make conclusions based on what's called substantial evidence, essentially either uh, expert opinion based on fact or facts. And so if there's two conflicting sides coming in or two conflicting sets of evidence, if the agency is going to make conclusions, it has to be based in one of those. It can't be something that's off here that has no basis. That's what the case law tells us. So yet another related question. So feasible mitigation measures. Let's suppose that the EIR, the lead agency, um, listed some feasible mitigation measures, but some in the community don't think that the treatment of feasible mitigation measures in the EIR was adequate, and they point to some new studies or something or something from Europe that says, well, other feasible mitigation measures are possible. Right. And let's suppose that the community challenged the lead agency in court. So is there a case law that indicates the way the courts rule on these things? I mean, do the courts usually fall back on what sort of established expert opinion, such as TSCA says, are feasible mitigation measures in, in a case like that? Right, yeah. I'm not an attorney, so I don't offer legal advice, but what the courts generally do is that the courts uh, will, in most cases, defer to the agency in, in these situations. And so yes. they'll, right, to the lead agency. So they'll be looking to see whether or not the lead agency has what they call substantial evidence, factual evidence, to support its conclusions. So if there's uh, conflicting evidence that's presented in the environmental impact report, if the agency has decided to go with, I guess this would be on your, on your left-hand side, on the left-hand uh, information, uh, the court will support that decision as long as the left-hand information is factual information that has some basis in fact, or it could be expert opinion based in fact. On the other hand, if there's competing opinions or if there's just one opinion, uh, and the, the agency decides to go with something else and there's no factual basis for that, the courts won't support that. The courts will require the agency to go back and redo that portion of the environmental impact report. So they, the, what happens in general is that uh, courts don't tell an agency, uh, we're going we're gonna to stop this project. They, instead, what they tell the agency is, this uh, environmental impact report is inadequate and these are the areas that need to be fixed. We're going to invalidate that for a period of time. You can go back and fix it and come back and show us how you fixed it. And if we, the court, are satisfied with that, then you can go forward again. But we're going to make sure that it, it meets, it's up to snuff um, before you go forward with the project uh, or you don't get to go forward with it at all. Now, when I say go forward with it, I mean go forward with the processing of the project. Uh, if you were uh, a litigant who were, who were uh, suing a city, you have to ask you, you, you have to do th two things in order to actually stop a project or to put the brakes on a project. One is you would challenge the CEQA issue, right? But you'd also have to ask for an injunction or some similar sort of action in order to actually stop the project. Uh, because if you'd simply ask for CEQA relief, uh, that doesn't mean that the project itself is stopped. It means that the CEQA process has been stopped, uh, but at their own risk, uh, applicants can continue with the project if, if a city allows them to do so. There's a court case down in uh, Kern County uh, maybe five, six, seven years ago, another one in Fresno County a few years before that, uh, where by the time something made its way through the appellate court, the project was actually almost built in Kern County. And in Fresno County, it literally was built. It was a car wash because it was a relatively small project. The two years it took to get through the appellate court process, uh, the applicant had actually built the thing. So if you want to actually stop the project, at least for a period of time, uh, you have to ask for a separate action, a separate injunction in order to do that. But the courts will generally defer to agencies if the agency's um, conclusions are, are factually based. That's the way it works. The, the exception to that is where the agencies are, where the courts are looking at something with, that they call, um, uh, what do they call it? A question of law. Where it's a question of law, uh, they look upon that as being something where they can apply their independent judgment. So again, they're going to look for factual information, but the, the courts are going to not offer complete deference to the agency. Whereas if it's simply a question of fact, which is what usually comes up in, in these cases, it's usually a question of fact, not a question of law. Questions of fact, they defer to the agency on. It's a long-winded answer, but does that, is that satisfactory? I think so. It's just, okay. you know, 
Right, and feasible, that was the other thing I was going to say. Feasible means that it can be accomplished in a reasonable period of time, uh, taking into consideration economic, uh, social, legal, uh, technological, and other considerations. So that's, you know, more or less, that's paraphrasing what CEQA's definition of feasible is. So in order for an agency to say, well, that's just not feasible, uh, they're required to actually say why it's not feasible. And they have to have, again, factual evidence that indicates that, well, you know, there's legal limitations. Uh, we can't do that mitigation because uh, we don't have the authority to require that. Uh, maybe the mitigation is demanding that some other agency take a particular action. Well, the city can't tell another agency to take any action. So that mitigation measure wouldn't be feasible. Uh, perhaps it's a mitigation measure that uh, is not just a little more expensive than the project, but so much more expensive that no reasonable person would, would undertake it. That might be economically infeasible. Um, technologically infeasible, perhaps it's a process that's never been done before. It's an experimental process, and there's an argument, maybe, that because it's experimental, we don't know if it's going to work, and we're going to consider it infeasible. Uh, socially infeasible, there's been some court cases recently uh, where there's even been the, the situation where something was found to be socially infeasible, uh, primarily because um, it went against what, uh, what city policies, what established city policies provided for. And so the city said, well, you know, this is really not really feasible because it, it's contrary to our adopted policies. So that's what they would have to show. And that pops up at the very end, well, two places in the CEQA process. One is in the responses to comments. We'll talk about that done for the draft EIR trans, um, as it transmogrifies into the final EIR. The agency will be responding and writing to all the comments that come in. So those responses are going to provide that sort of evidence as to why it's infeasible. And then at the end of the process, when the agency adopts findings, the findings also, if they decide not to adopt some particular measure, Findings have to explain why the thing is infeasible. Otherwise, the findings won't hold up. And there have been some new court cases in the last few years where the courts have um, looked at findings and said, well, look, your findings don't hold water. And so we're going to invalidate the EIR on the basis of the findings not holding water. And until you fix your findings, um, you know, we're, going to rescind a, we're going to require that you rescind approval of the project. So it's complicated, but that's, that's how CEQA works. Okay, so uh, did I ever hit this? Yeah, here we go. So what's the purpose of CEQA? Again, examining potential impacts, disclosing feasible mitigation measures, and analyzing project alternatives in an environmental impact report. Alternatives are seen in some ways a bit like the mitigation measures. They're intended to reduce one or more of the significant effects that a project might otherwise have, uh, while at the same time um, meeting most or all of the project objectives. So they kind of would do the same thing that the project intends to do, uh, but they would do it at, at least in one, one instance, some lesser environmental cost, lesser environmental impact. Uh, so how does it influence decision making? The lead and responsible agencies have to look at an EIR. They have to consider its information. They have to consider the con comments that have come in from the public uh, before they can take action on their project. Uh, CEQA allows them to deny a project. CEQA allows them to approve a project. CEQA is just there to provide the information. It doesn't approve or deny the project itself. And then it's required that feasible mitigation has to be incorporated into the approval uh, or the agency has to explain why. And it's incorporated in either because conditions of approval, uh, it could be changes required of the project, um, could be things along those lines. But something that, that uh, commits the agency to making sure that this is going to be done, this mitigation measure is going to be done. Okay, so uh, at the end of the process, the agency is required to adopt something called findings. And they're basically required to explain the disposition of each of the significant effects that was identified in the EIR. And so there's three different choices for the findings. One is that we're applying mitigation measures, and these mitigation measures are going to reduce it below a level of significance. Uh, another one might be those mitigation measures that we've identified are actually the responsibility of another agency, and they will apply them. And then the third one would be that for specific reasons, either the mitigation measures or the alternatives that we've identified are infeasible. And here are the reasons. So the findings would lay all of that out. And the agency is required on adopting, uh, on approving a project, if they do not select one of the alternatives, they're required to explain why those alternatives are infeasible. So the findings will have to have discussion of why they're infeasible. 
basically using the same approach that I said before, social, economic, technological, legal issues that make them infeasible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One moment, please. Okay. Are we talking about the lead, just the lead agency goes through this process? For example, the DTSC. <clears throat> Yes, the DTSC, DTSC is, have to go through the same, they will do the same, same thing. They will also findings. adopt findings, right. And their findings will be along the same lines. And they'll say it's the they'll responsibility of the Regional Water Quality Control Board or, right. or somebody else. Yeah, because okay. typically the environmental impact report is going to include mitigation measures that are not only the responsibility of the lead agency, but also mitigation measures that actually belong to these other responsible agencies. So as each of the responsible agency uses the EIR, they're going to have to make a finding as to what the disposition was of that impact that relates to them and what happened with that mitigation measure. Did they adopt it? Uh, was it infeasible? If it was infeasible, why is it infeasible? They'd have to make these same sets of findings. Uh, they don't necessarily have to make a statement of override, I don't think, but they have to make the findings. But the lead agency also has to make a statement of overriding considerations if there's a significant and unavoidable impact, and that is essentially a statement that explains what benefits the project have has that outweigh whatever uh, significant unavoidable impacts it has. And again, they have to be specific. What are the specific benefits of, that are either economic or legal, uh, technological uh, or social? Uh, what are the particular things that are benefits of this project that outweigh its, its costs? And that's also a specific requirement. If an agency fails to do these, fails to make these findings, or if the agency uh, fails to have evidence that supports the findings, that can be uh, grounds for a court to invalidate the environmental impact report. So it's really important that they do that. Then we have this idea of one project, one document. As you mentioned, there's lead agencies, there's responsible agencies. The lead agency runs the CEQA process. They prepare the environmental impact report. They make the determinations as to what's significant, what isn't significant. Uh, they make the calls as to what methodology we're going to use, what standards we're going to apply, uh, what we're going to include in the EIR. All of those sorts of things are decided by the lead agency. And then the responsible agencies uh, are there to use that same document when it comes their time to consider permitting the project and then apply that document to their permitting process. And as we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, the lead agency's document, when the responsible agencies use it, uh, can be added on to, can be supplemented, uh, what's called a subsequent EIR, a supplemental EIR. Uh, if circumstances have changed, uh, if there's new information that hadn't been available before, if the project itself has changed. So that as the responsible agencies look at the project, they also have an obligation to ensure that they're keeping th uh, the best information, good faith effort, the best information, and disclosing any new impacts uh, that might result from their, their decisions, too. Did you have a question? It's a short question. Mm -hmm. the, definition of respons the definition of responsible agency, is that an agency with regulatory jurisdiction? Right. Or is it anybody else? It would be an agency with regulatory jurisdiction, exactly, yeah. And by that, we would mean an agency that has discretionary permitting uh, power over the project. If all they have is ministerial power, they wouldn't be a responsible agency. So they have to have discretionary power over the project. Uh, ministerial power is something along the lines of uh, you know, issuance of a built business license, where you simply meet a, a, a standard, uh, you walk in the door, they see that you've met the standard, they stamp it, and you walk out the door. The agency doesn't have any discretion. They don't have to put any thought process into uh, granting you that, that business license. So some things are ministerial. Some things are discretionary. It's responsible agencies are those that are issuing discretionary permits for the project or discretionary approvals, licenses for the project. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. And they're all supposed to use, at least start, with the same environmental document. They all start with the original EIR that the lead agency prepared. And then as new information is available when it comes time for them to do their job, then they must disclose that new information. Okay. So when you do the program EIR, the EIR for the project, that's just one start to the CEQA process, but not necessarily the end of it. CEQA continues to live on. Uh, let's see. So there's some limited exceptions to the idea of responsible agencies being obligated to use the EIR. 
Uh, if a responsible agency sues the lead agency over the adequacy of the EIR, then they don't have to use it. Uh, as I mentioned, if they uh, take a look at the circumstances or the information that's available or the project has been revised and they would find that there's some additional uh, potential impacts, then they're not obligated to use the EIR, but they can go beyond the EIR and prepare uh, what's either a supplemental EIR or a subsequent EIR to um, kind of add on to the body of knowledge. And then uh, the responsible agency is not uh, required to approve the project, even though the lead agency may have. Uh, they're not required to do that. Uh, and they can apply their own conditions of approval based on whatever their regulatory authority is. So they're not bound necessarily to the regulatory authority that um, the lead agency has. They have their own authority and they can apply their own sorts of conditions of approval. And then, as I say, they can deny the project if they want. It can happen. It doesn't happen a lot, no. It doesn't happen often. It doesn't happen often because in most cases agencies have been talking with one another. And so they have a pretty good idea of this project is coming down the road. Uh, and the project, in many cases, the project has been designed in such a way that it's intended to be approved by other agencies. Uh, but I do have an example of where this happened one time. Uh, in my hometown, Sacramento, my current hometown anyway, it's not really my hometown, I'm actually from Marin County, but um, in Sacramento there was a project approved along the Sacramento River. It was going to be, a, or it is a hotel uh, and a restaurant and I think some little boating dock or something there on the river. It was proposed to be built right on the Sacramento levee. Sacramento levee uh, development is regulated by the, uh, what was then called the Reclamation Board, the State Reclamation Board. And so in order to get a permit to do that, you have to get a permit from the Reclamation Board. Simple city approval isn't enough. So the developer went to the city, they got their permits, they did an environmental impact report. For one reason or another, the city never sent the report to the Reclamation Board, so the Reclamation Board had no idea that the project was coming along. The applicant, who should have known better, uh, never contacted the Reclamation Board. Uh, the Reclamation Board looked at the approval when the applicant came to them and said, we're not approving that. It's on top of the levy. We just don't approve things on top of the levy. <coughs> and so what ended up happen, happening was the city, city of my, my city, my hometown, uh, ended up taking responsibility for that portion of the levy along the Sacramento River uh, and, taking their own, and taking liability and all that sort of stuff uh, because the Reclamation Board wouldn't have approved anything to be built on top of the levy unless that was the case. So the city had to more or less stick its neck out here, which they've done, uh, in order to get that approval, because otherwise that project would not have been approved. It approved by the city, but not by the Reclamation Board, because within the Reclamation Board's authority, that was something they just didn't do. We just don't approve projects sitting on top of our levees. Yeah, so it can happen. Uh, it uh, can commonly happen, too. It's more common where it's a federal agency, where um, you know it's a city, county, uh, some other state agency doing CEQA, uh, it doesn't require necessarily that you uh, consult with federal agencies. And so you can have situations where a CEQA document has been done, the city, county, whoever it was, approved the project. Uh, the project now requires some federal permit, and getting the federal permit is much more difficult. It can be much more difficult in some cases. Uh, there are some sorts of federal permits where you have to indicate to the federal agency that you have selected what they call the least environmentally damaging uh, probable alternative, put least environmentally damaging practicable alternative. Uh, and unless you can show that what you've selected as your project is the least environmentally damaging practicable alternative, they won't approve it. Uh, and so you can have situations where an, an environmental impact report was done. Uh, it looked at a variety of different alternatives. Uh, it approved the project. But when it comes down to it, that federal agency, because they weren't involved, don't recognize any of those alternatives as being potentially the, the uh, lead power, the least environmentally damaging practicable alternative, and they don't recognize the project as being so either. And so the applicant has to go through this whole process of proving that their project and perhaps their project as they amend it uh, meet the lead power requirements. So sometimes it pops up with federal agencies. So uh, there is this potential where you can have a project approved, but then some later agency denies it. Not as often as when we're dealing with uh, state responsible agencies, but sometimes it pops up outside the CEQA process where you've got a federal agency. Okay, so program EIRs in general, oops. Looks like a storm or something. Not sure where that is. Maybe the California coast, I would guess. So lead agency, who prepares it? Uh, some people worry that there is a conflict of interest because lead agencies are in charge of this process. Um, 
CEQA doesn't see it that way. From its very beginning, CEQA has placed all of this responsibility on the lead agencies uh, with the caveat that if you don't do a good job, we're leaving it open to just about anybody to sue you. Um, and if you don't do a good job, the courts are going to attempt to um, interpret CEQA to its fullest extent, and chances are you're going to lose. So that's what's intended to keep agencies in line. Rather than having a CEQA police agency that's over overseeing everything, um, rather than having uh, some outside body doing all the EIRs in the state, instead the uh, legislature and Governor Reagan and Governor Sinsim uh, basically had the idea that we'll have every agency that's issuing discretionary permits within California becoming a lead agency, and they will do all the EIRs as necessary throughout the state, overseen by the public, essentially, uh, who could potentially bring litigation against them. So a lead agency can also decide who prepares the EIR. They can do it themselves. Uh, they can hire a consultant to, to prepare a portion, as, as the uh, city of Brisbane has done. They can hire a consultant to do a portion, or all, the way the city has, all of the EIR. Uh, they can even uh, have the applicant turn in an administrative draft EIR. So the applicant gets the first shot at a rough cut of, of the draft EIR. Um, this, does not, this third one doesn't happen all that often in Northern California, but it's not uncommon to see in Southern California. What is intended to keep this whole process relatively honest is the lead agency is required to exert independent judgment over what goes into the public draft EIR. So what's released to the public is intended to reflect the independent judgment of the agency. So the agency had better make sure that it takes a look at the administrative draft that it receives from its own consultant, or if you're in Southern California or someplace that allows the applicant to submit these, that you looked at the applicant's submittal and you're very clear that that reflects what the city's opinion is, uh, what the city's standards are, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, I was dealing with a county in, Southern San Joaqu in the Southern San Joaquin Valley um, that up until relatively recently used to let consult uh, applicants consultants do the EIRs, and they found that they were kicking back the EIRs four or five times because they just couldn't seem to get it right. Uh, but there are still some counties here and there that we work with uh, that have hired um, my firm, for example, and they hire other firms as well, to provide peer review. So the applicant prepares, the, their consultant prepares the EIR, but then someone else is hired to look over that EIR for its adequacy. It's not uncommon for them on uh, controversial projects to bring in you know, a third party to review it just to make sure. So that the agency has somebody who's telling them straight up whether or not this thing is adequate and what sorts of changes might need to be made to it. Yes, question or comment? I'm kind of deeply troubled by what looks to me like a conflict of interest. Would you use the term conflict of interest? And the problem I'm having is that the city's policy is to uh, to to go ahead and, and handle the EIR, but that the applicant pays. Right. Uh, uh, but at this moment, $600,000 worth of bills are, are accumulated by the people who are preparing the EIR, and really the city's paying it. So in effect, they've gone into partnership with the developer on a project which has not gone through the EIR project and which has not been approved. And that's what it looks like. And I, I just... I can't see how you can think that that's independent judgment. Well, the independent. Uh, if, you, mm -hmm. if you've got, if somebody owes you $600,000 and you're not necessarily paid unless things go forward, that is kind of, it's why, how is that independent? Well, the independent judgment is independent judgment over the contents of the environmental impact report. And it's up to the city to decide how far out it wants to allow the developer to go as far as um, paying the money. But CEQA provides that uh, you can charge a developer, and it's commonly done, probably 99% of the agencies around the state uh, actually fund their CEQA process through a developer. And it can be funded not only for preparation of the environmental impact report uh, and supporting documents, uh, but it can also reach out to the mitigation monitoring and reporting program. Uh, if the project is approved, uh, it's required that there be some program to ensure that the mitigation measures get implemented, and that too can be charged to the developer. Yeah, and that's something that's outside of CEQA. I, I can't talk to that because it's, you know, it's not something that CEQA prohibits. It's not something that CEQA condones. It's just outside of CEQA. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so program EIRs, which is what uh, this Baylands 
is going to be uh, generally done on big projects, generally done on projects you're going to build out over a long period of time, projects that will have a number of phases. Uh, those, that's what the program ER is generally prepared for. Uh, there's not a whole lot of difference between a project EIR and a program EIR as far, as far as content goes. Uh, you read through them, they're going to look almost the same. They're going to have an executive summary. They're going to have impact sections that look very similar to one another. Where the differences occur between them is that a program EIR is generally set up from the beginning with the idea that it's going to be the foundation for later environmental analyses. And in many cases, projects that are being considered through a program EIR still have uh, later phases and other sorts of activities that are not as well defined as if you had a singular project that is you know, a subdivision or something like that. If you have a subdivision, some sort of particular project, you generally know a lot of stuff about that. It's going to be single family homes. Streets are going to be 60 feet wide. There's going to be curb and gutter. Uh, they're going to be putting a detention pond over here. Uh, that sort of thing. There aren't a lot of blobs on the map. Uh, there are lines on the map. Uh, projects that have blobs on the map, like a specific plan, that sort of thing, uh, those tend to be more general in their analysis because the information available about them tends to be more general. So the program EIR is done it's more general than you might see for a project EIR, but it's because as later permits are approved, or as later discretionary actions are taken by the city for that matter, um, as more information becomes available, more information has to be produced in later environmental documents. So subsequent EIR, subsequent mitigated negative declaration, uh, later disclosures are going to occur on that project as more information becomes available about it and as later discretionary actions are taken either by the lead agency or by responsible agencies. And later activities by the lead agency might be things like uh, subdivision maps. Um, maps for, I should say, approvals of infrastructure installation, uh, things like that. So as long as there's a discretionary action that the lead agency has that hasn't been analyzed in that original EIR, then they'll be doing additional analysis at that time. Okay, so that's the idea behind a program EIR. The mitigation, in fact, may lack some of the details that you see in a project EIR, uh, and CEQA allows that within certain bounds. Uh, again, the, the courts have essentially laid out the bounds for it, and they say that the agency has to commit to mitigation. In other words, there has to be a discrete mitigation measure written out, and the mitigation measure has to have performance standards that are going to have to be met. So even though it is not absolutely precise, as you would find in some mitigation measures, it has to have standards that are going to have to be met by mitigation that's developed over time. And then it has to have a way of... Um, being able to uh, show that those, those measures are going to be effective, has to have measures of effectiveness. Okay, so uh, I guess I already said that. It has to look at the project, any related actions, level of detail commensurate with the project's level of detail. So where you have general, you're going to end up with general. Uh, where you have very specific, you're going to end up with specific in your EIR. You can, as quite common for EIRs, program EIRs, to have some portions of the project described in more detail than other portions of the project, where they know more about one portion of the project and less about other portions. Uh, as I mentioned, you can't defer the measures, but you can mitigation, but you can include performance standards and that sort of thing. Uh, let's see what else. Yeah, and then later discretionary actions will be examined for potential impacts, and that can result in subsequent EIRs, subsequent mitigated negative declarations if there's a less than significant impact, um, supplemental EIRs, that sort of thing. So there's additional disclosure as time goes by. And additional mitigation, too. This is just another way of looking at it. Uh, these are the CEQA sections, or CEQA guidelines sections, if you want to take a look at them. 15162, and it talks about subsequent EIRs and how those are triggered. And then supplemental EIRs are 15163, and then addendums, 15164. Addendums are intended to be used only where there are very minor technical changes necessary to the original EIR. Those are not circulated for public review. So those are used for just very minor changes. These subsequent EIRs, supplemental EIRs, those are prepared just as this EIR is. They have to be prepared in draft form, released for public review, a final prepared, and then the agency has to make findings. And if there's still significant unavoidable impacts, a statement of overriding considerations, just as if they were doing uh, an EIR for the project to begin with. So these are, oops, wrong button. 
these are, when they say EIRs, they may mean EIRs. The difference between a subsequent EIR, a supplemental EIR, and the original EIR is that generally these will be focusing in on particular issues that have been brought up by the new information or the changes to the project uh, or the changes to the circumstances under which the project is being undertaken um, that need to be focused in on. So if there's a new significant effect, the supplemental EIR is going to talk about that new significant effect. It's not going to talk about other effects that uh, aren't new. Okay, so these, these supplemental subsequent EIRs are looking at new stuff that's popped up since the preparation of the original EIR and disclosing that new stuff. Uh, so uh, in order for something to fall under this subsequent EIR process, um, it has to be something that's within the scope of the program EIR. So it has to be an activity that was essentially contemplated or a part of the original project that was approved. Uh, and it has to be within the geographic area that was analyzed in that original, that original program EIR. So for example, there was a court case uh, 20 years ago probably up in Sonoma County. Uh, Sonoma County prepared a, um, a uh, why do I always forget what this is? Uh, gravel mining ordinance. Uh, they adopted the gravel mining ordinance for a portion of the Russian River, but not all of it. Uh, they have a, had a gravel mining company come in shortly thereafter. And what do you know, they wanted to actually install a gravel mine outside the area that had been covered by the program EIR. The county, hoping to help them out, said, well, you know, that's pretty close. We'll just adopt the program EIR again for your project too, and away we go. Uh, they ended up getting sued, and the court said, look, this isn't within the scope of the program EIR. It's actually outside of the area that you analyzed. So since it's outside the area you analyzed, you can't use this EIR for it. You have to prepare a separate EIR because it's outside the area that was analyzed. Okay, so that's kind of the rule that's created here for uh, what is within the scope. Has to be within the geographic area. Has to be something that's essentially the same as the original project. So it can be uh, revisions to the original project. Uh, can be kind of uh, moving things around, perhaps, within the project area, uh, provided that uh, you're not doing something completely different. If, for example, it came up uh, Saturday, someone suggested, well, what if they decide that instead of having a mixed-use project, uh, they're going to put in just all industrial? <laughs> Something like that may require a new EIR. Maybe that the program EIR originally done uh, can't be stretched that far. And it may be it's something that requires a totally new EIR. Because it may be that it has impacts that are so different, and the project itself is so different, that you really can't say that it's within the scope of the project originally analyzed in the program EIR. So if you're outside the scope, that means that you may have to start from scratch and prepare a new EIR for that, that particular action. OK, so what else? Uh, so I talked about within the scope. Oh yeah, so these later activities, as I mentioned, it's limited to what's new. Uh, the original program EIR isn't open for reanalysis, strangely enough. Uh, CEQA does not require that you go back and uh, update an EIR. So once an EIR is approved by an agency or adopted by an agency, uh, that's it. It doesn't have any particular shelf life. It can stay around for 10, 15, 20 years, whatever. Uh, how, what CEQA does is that CEQA requires that as new information comes along that you prepare a subsequent EIR or a supplemental EIR. But it doesn't require the agency to go back and make changes to the original EIR. And that's simply the way that CEQA is written. Uh, it may be because it's becoming a bit anachronistic. I don't know, but that's, that's how CEQA is written. So it doesn't become outdated. Uh, long periods can pass. Oh, here she comes. Long periods can pass where the agency, uh, you know, where the, the EIR has sat on the shelf for a long time. And nonetheless, it can be reused again as long as you go through that process of determining whether or not there's a new impact or a more severe impact as a result of changes to the project. Uh, changes in circumstances or new information. So a question or comment? Yeah, I have a question. It, it seems to me that <clears throat> there could be differences of opinion on this topic. And there we've, we've had that happen in here in Brisbane. Um, so what is the case law in terms of um, the, what, ki what, kind of what kind of later activities will actually trigger the need for a subsequent EIR? Yeah, good question. Uh, generally, it's going to be something that uh, wasn't, wasn't covered at all in the original program EIR. 
uh, or it's going to be something that's, that's literally outside of the geographic area of the program EIR. Most of the cases have been actually in Southern California uh, where this has come up. Uh, San Diego, Los Angeles. Uh, there are a number of cases within the last five, ten years uh, relating to redevelopment agencies down in San Diego and, and in Los Angeles. Um, and they're the one, those are the cases that essentially show that there's not much of a shelf life, uh, or there is no shelf life, I should say, for a program EIR. Because in those cases, uh, the agencies were essentially reusing an EIR, readopting an EIR, it was 10, 15 years old. And they had gone through and documented that there really hadn't been any changes over that period of time that were si significant enough or substantial enough to show that there was a new impact. And so because they had documented it, the courts upheld uh, the use of these, these uh, older EIRs. And in those cases, the court was basically looking to see whether or not, uh, number one, they had documented that whether or not there were any changes, and number two, uh, whether this project was essentially the same as what had originally been analyzed in that older EIR. And at least in Southern California, in the San Diego area, the courts there have been relatively liberal about what they consider to be um, the same project. Uh, there was a, the, a case in uh, San Diego with a redevelopment project, and essentially they, there had been sort of a blob within the redevelopment plan that indicated that we're going to have uh, hotels within this part of downtown San Diego. Uh, and it identified, I think, a total square footage for, for the amount of hotel space that was going to be allowed. So it created kind of an envelope of how big, you know, how much area of hotel. Not necessarily how tall or how broad or how much land they were going to cover. Uh, and so what comes in but this tall, sort of tall hotel, um, lawsuit happens, and the court said, well, you know, it looks to us as though it fits under the envelope. It looks as though it fits into this square footage that was analyzed originally. And you, the city, you've looked at the traffic ramifications. There seems to be no change in the traffic, so on and so forth. Um, we're going to let you pass on this one. Uh, in uh, Los Angeles, there was a case with the redevelopment agency where it was I don't remember the, the actual thing, but let's pretend. It was something along the lines of they had approved mixed-use development. Uh, let's say it was three buildings of, um, I don't know, let's say five buildings. Five buildings 30 stories high. Uh, and it was going to be mostly um, residences with a little bit, no, it was mostly offices with a little bit of residence. Uh, so instead, they built three buildings 50 stories high, uh, and it was mostly residences with just a little bit of, I should say mostly offices with just a little bit of residences. So they kind of flipped things around. And in that case, also, the court said, well, you know, that looks pretty close to us. Square footage is about the same. Uh, it's still mixed use because you've still got a mix of uses there. Uh, you've looked at all the potential impacts. It looks as though there are no new impacts, with one exception. Turned out to be police services. Uh, but everything else looks as though it's a wash. You know, if it hadn't been for that, we would have let you go, but we're not. You're going to have to redo your EIR, but you're going to have to do a subsequent EIR, but only on that one issue, police services. So um, the courts have been relatively liberal in, in how they look at this, or conservative, whatever you want to call it, but they've been relatively liberal. This is different. This subsequent uh, EIR process is different than the process that's applied to a project for the first time. So if you were looking at a project, and this is the first EIR that's ever done for this project, uh, there's a relatively low threshold for triggering an EIR. But once an EIR is done, then in the interest of finality, is what the courts have been saying, in the interest of finality, uh, they're going to only require a subsequent EIR if there's this new information, changes in the project, or um, changes in the circumstances that indicate there's going to be some new impact that hadn't been analyzed. Or one of the impacts that was analyzed before is now substantially more severe. Okay, so it, once you've done an EIR, then it's building on that EIR rather than doing new EIRs. Uh, yes, you have a comment or a question? I had a question about um, changing, sorry, changing standards. Uh, for example, whether it would fall under CEQA or somewhere else, uh, if um, there's a pretty likely possibility that the maximum level of contaminants, some of the contaminants present, will change and it will the result will be that the maximum level is over what is acceptable and they'll have to do something about it. Well, if that happens or if uh, elements that are there are found to be, uh, are reclassified as contaminants that are regulated, would that trigger a subsequent EIR or 
or just action on the part of the responsible agency? Would that be something that would trigger? Yeah, that's something that possibly would trigger a subsequent EIR. I can't speak for the responsible agency, but that's the sort of thing that's intended to trigger it, right. Yeah, and it's going to depend. Now, one of the things, I guess we, we took that sheet down, but one of the things that's popped up recently in CEQA case law, talking about case law, is the question of whether or not CEQA applies to the environment's impacts on the project. Uh, up until now, uh, at least in Northern California, we've looked at CEQA as having two things that it looks at. It looks at the impact of the project on the environment, but it also looks at the impact of the environment on the project. For example, uh, you know, hazardous materials or uh, toxic air contaminants of projects that are proposed to go in next to freeways, that sort of thing. Uh, but there's a line of court cases now coming out of Southern California uh, in both Orange County and in uh, Los Angeles uh, where the courts have been saying, well, we've looked at CEQA and we can't find any, any language in there that says that you're required to look at impacts of the environment on the project. Uh, and there have been several different cases now. One was in Dana Point where a uh, subdivision was proposed next to the wastewater treatment plant and the wastewater treatment plant authority sued the city of Dana Point saying that uh, this is going to cause all kinds of problems for that, that subdivision because of the odors and the noise from the wastewater treatment plant and the court said no that's not a CEQA issue. Uh, there was another case in uh, Long Beach where I think it was the, either Long Beach? Long Beach and the Los Angeles Unified School District got into a tussle over a new high school being proposed in Long Beach uh, with the city arguing that there would be potential impacts from uh, uh, the port of Long Beach and also the trucks and trains that go in and out of the port of Long Beach all the time. And that those would have adverse effects on the students and also there'd be parking problems. Uh, but the court said, no. Now that's an impact of the environment on the project, not the project on the environment. And so those uh, potential toxic air contaminants and those sorts of things we don't think matter. And then the most recent one was down on, in the Bayona wetlands uh, in Los Angeles uh, where the argument was raised that uh, this project might be subject to sea level rise, inundation due to sea level rise. Uh, and even though the county, or I should say the city, I think it was the city, even though the lead agency had done a study that indicated that uh, this project was well inland, that because of the geography, the elevation of it, it actually wasn't subject to sea level rise. The opponents had argued that it was, but they were using very general maps that had been done for the entire coast of California. And once you got down to the brass tacks on that particular site and really looked at it, the maps were wrong. Uh, but the court didn't focus on that. The court simply said, well, you know, that's all well and good. We don't even care about that because this is an impact of the environment on the project. And since that's the case, you don't need to look at it under CEQA. So we're getting some, what I think, kind of crazy decisions I guess this is being taped, isn't it? We're getting some, some <laughs> unusual decisions uh, from the courts down in Southern California. And they may be harbingers of uh, us seeing the same sorts of arguments popping up here in Northern California. So I don't know, you know, in five years, you know, if the courts evolve along those lines, whether what we're describing now would actually occur, because it might be an impact of the environment on the project. But under what we do today, today's uh, practice, uh, I would say yes, that's something that could potentially uh, trigger a subsequent EIR. Page 13, uh -huh. uh, where it says that the level of detail is commensurate with the project's level of detail and reasonable analyses cannot be deferred. So that would mean if information is available about impacts, then that information, can I use the word must be, must be analyzed. Right, right. If the information is available, it has to go into the EIR, right. And they have Despite to analyze it. Despite the fact it. that this is a program EIR. Despite the fact that it's a program EIR, right. Uh, there's a court case out of, St I think it was Stanislaw County, maybe 20 years ago, again, getting back, goes back a ways. Uh, but it was a case where the county was considering uh, what they called in those days a new town. In other words, a developer had come forward with a specific, or a area of the, of the county where they wanted to build essentially a new city. Uh, and what they were going to do was come back later with specific plans that were going to cover various portions of this, this property. And so when the county prepared the EIR to consider the general plan amendment and the, the basic zone change that they needed, uh, they said, well, you know, water's an issue here. It's a significant unavoidable impact, actually. And we're going to analyze it when we get down to those EIRs on the specific plan. 
And so when it went to court, the court said, no, you can't do that. Here we have a key issue uh, about this project, water, water supply, availability of water. Uh, and not only that, what, if you get the water, what impacts does getting the water have? Uh, that's a key issue that has to be analyzed right now. You have enough information to analyze it. You have a general idea. If you look in the project description, you have a general idea how many people are going to be there, general idea of how much commerce there's going to be there. You can plug in some basic figures and come up with water demand, uh, and, you know, ultimate water demand. And from that, you can get an idea of whether or not there's available water, whether it's going to be tapping groundwater, whether it's going to be overdrafting the groundwater. You can't just say that it's significant and unavoidable. You have to analyze it, too. It's not enough to just jump to your conclusion. You have to have an analysis that supports that conclusion. So um, I think that court case is pretty clear. And I, I haven't seen any court cases that have said anything different than that. You know a little bit about the Baylands. A little bit, yeah. OK, well, so it's, it's, it's a dump. Um, <laughs> like Betty, is it what Betty Davis was, said as she was going, what the dump? Yeah. Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, so so it, 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 you were talking about the impact of the environment on the project. <coughs> the project filled the bay. I mean, the, the, this, this whole area, is, it, almost, almost the whole area is filled. Um, and one of our, probably our primary concern is the contaminants that were dumped there. So does that fall within the scope of the environment's impact on the project or because it's actually part of the project? Um, does it not fall within that scope? Yeah, that's the $64,000 question. What we're operating under right now is the assumption that we have to analyze all of that. That that is part of the you know that is part of the environmental analysis. But what I mean to say is that there is a there seems to be seeping out of Southern California a new line of thought from the from the courts, and so it will only be a matter of time, probably a relatively short matter of time, before we see these court cases being held up as precedent in arguments against uh, analyzing impacts of the environment on the project. So there's no telling. Um, you know, what's going to happen from that? It could be that um, maybe in a few years the California Supreme Court will weigh in on one of these cases and um, make a determin one, determination one way or another. Uh, maybe they'll continue to be a, a split in the courts. Uh, maybe it will be one of those deals where um, Northern California courts begin to take up the same approach. I don't know. It popped up recently as an argument in the, uh, the court case, superior court case against the Bay Area Air Quality Management District's uh, CEQA guidelines. They adopted CEQA guidelines when it was last year sometime, uh, and they were sued. Uh, the court, the Superior Court, did not take up that, that line. It found other reasons to overturn the, the guidelines and to require that uh, the Bay Area Air Quality Management District prepare an environmental impact report before adopting its air quality guidelines. Uh, but that was one of the things that was, that was asked about by the opponents. They said, well, look at this. This is an issue. You know, we've got this impact of the environment on the project, and you shouldn't have to look at that. And their guidelines for toxic air contaminants are basically saying that toxic air contaminants, um, the existence of toxic air contaminants along freeways requires setbacks. But we think that's an impact on the environment on the project and shouldn't be, shouldn't be analyzed. So we'll see. Yes? Um, well, the problem is if you did not build somewhere, if you did not build over there, I mean, I'm for a project here. OK. Um, if there were nothing built, there would be, I mean, just say there was methane leaking or something, some kind of contaminant. If you did nothing, then that wouldn't be a problem. As soon as you build something, then it becomes a problem. I mean, maybe you, you drill down and you hit something. So it seems like it would have to be considered in the EIR. Right, and you're preaching to the choir here, the choir of one. Uh, that, that's my thought, too. But I thought I would bring this up. Because, as I say, there's a line of court cases now coming out of Southern California, and um, you know, it may mean changes in CEQA practice. Uh, I personally have asked people over at the legislature whether or not they're concerned about this, legislative staffers, uh, and they have not had much of a concern for one reason or another. Uh, so we, I, I don't hold out a lot of hope for the legislature stepping in and clarifying this. Uh, so it may be something that we'll just have to wait to see what happens with the courts. But I just thought I would bring it up. As if we weren't confusing enough, right? Bring it up just to make it more confusing. 
Okay, so let's see. Uh, so we talked about subsequent EIR. So these are the things that would trigger a subsequent EIR. Substantial changes in the project, changes in circumstances, new information of substantial importance, uh, any one of those. So under current law, the way that we look at things today, it could be that, yes, if we find new information about uh, higher levels of contamination than were considered under the existing EIR, that that might be something that indeed triggers the need to do a subsequent EIR. Or a subsequent mitigated negative declaration if there are mitigation measures that would clearly reduce uh, the level of contaminants below uh, whatever the level of the, uh, the acceptable level of risk is. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned before, it's not going to re-examine other parts of the EIR. It's going to focus in on those new effects. So it's just adding on to the EIR as time goes by. And let's see. I already mentioned that interest of finality. And then if there's litigation uh, over the activities of the responsible agency, someone says, well, look, there's all this new information, you're not doing a subsequent EIR, uh, that litigation is going to be on this subsequent document. It's not going to be on the original EIR. The original EIR is open for litigation for only a 30-day period after the, after the decision is made on the project, if they approve it, and there's a filing of a notice of determination. So there's only 30 days after the filing of that notice that's available for litigation. Once that statute of limitations runs, then that EIR cannot be cannot be litigated. Yes. Oh, sorry. I, I set you up for that one, didn't I? Okay. It's like Mother May I or something, a red light, green light. What if, what if the, uh, the, Simon the, says, the yeah. city council has committed to the people that the people will make the final determination. <clears throat> but while they'll make a determination, their, their decision, but their, their decision is subject to a vote of the people, so when is the 30-day start? Oh, okay. So let's say that uh, the city council decides to put this uh, up for referendum, put it on the, on the ballot. <laughs> That's a good question. Not the EIR. I don't know. Project. This would be the project, right. The EIR can't be put up for referendum because it's an it's a informational document. So that, that can't be voted on. But the project could be voted on because it involves what are called legislative actions. I believe it involves what a general plan amendment, probably zone changes, that sort of thing. So legislative actions can be referended. Uh, so they could put it on a referendum. Uh, I, uh, an agency can't, a city or a county can't place an item on the ballot unless it has done CEQA. So they would have to have certified this environmental impact report before they do that. Um, and I don't know offhand when the statute of limitations would begin. But I would assume that once the agency has certified it, and once they've decided to place it on the referendum, that that might be when they have to file their notice of determination, and that would begin the clock ticking on the 30-day statute of limitations. But I don't know, because I'm not aware of any court, you know, any court cases that have interpreted this. Because you might argue that, well, it hasn't been approved. You know, they haven't actually approved it, so you can't file a notice of determination until the project is actually approved. No, even though, even what the train says, even though they disagree, this is the truth. Uh, you can't file a notice of determination until the project has been approved. It hasn't been approved until the voters approve it, right? So it may be that the notice of determination is, is filed after the voters take their vote. So on November 6th, let's say, um, someone takes this down and files it with the county clerk, and then the, the time starts from there. That might be how it works, but I don't know offhand. Either one sounds kind of reasonable. Okay, anything else on that topic? Okay. Uh, so typical EIR process, the notice of preparation, we've, the uh, city's gone through that. They send out this notice. It's basically to let agencies and people know that a draft EIR is going to be prepared and to get comments before they begin. So the idea is that they're scoping. In other words, they're trying to figure out the breadth of the scope of this environmental impact report. What are the issues that need to be analyzed? Uh, if someone suggests some alternatives, uh, should we include those alternatives in the EIR? That sort of thing. And then the key steps for the draft EIR uh, is putting together this draft uh, and then making it available to the public for at least 45 days. In Brisbane's case, they're going to make it available for 120 days. So there's going to be a 120-day review period. What is that? Well, I don't know how many times that is. Well, more than twice as much as what's normally required. So there'll be a 120-day review period. Uh, during that time, everybody needs to take a look at the EIR, go through it, uh, see where you think there may be some shortcomings, and then comment to the city about those shortcomings. 
And then once the review period ends, then the city and its consultants will sit down and they'll write uh, responses to each one of the comments that came in. And those responses, written responses, the comments, and then also the names of the people who commented, as well as any changes that they make to the EIR, will go into what's called the final EIR. Okay, so the final EIR discloses not only the project's potential impacts and mitigation measures and alternatives, but also what people and agencies had to say about it and what the, the lead agency's response is. So the decision makers have all that information in front of them. And so what is commonly done is that you will find kind of a two-part e final EIR. The first part being the uh, responses to comments, the comments, the list of commenters, changes to the draft EIR, and then the second part being the draft EIR itself. It's very common for agencies to have kind of a two-part final EIR. And both of those taken together, those make up the final EIR. Uh, the EIR has to be certified before the project can be approved. That means that the uh, City Council will have to say that uh, we have uh, looked at this EIR, we're familiar with it before we take our action. Uh, it reflects our independent judgment as the City Council and that we feel that it's adequate for purposes of CEQA. It meets CEQA's requirements. So they have to certify that formally, uh, usually in the, the form of some sort of a finding or a resolution uh, in order to go forward with making their decision on the project. So typical contents, uh, table of contents, executive summary, various impact set chapters, uh, usually a chapter on alternatives, because you have to talk about them somewhere. Uh, sometimes the pro uh, project alternatives end up in a, in a chapter talking about the project description. Sometimes the project description chapter thrown in here. Uh, cumulative and growth inducing impacts have to be looked at. You have to have a list of preparers, a list of references, uh, and then any technical appendices. So if there's traffic studies, um, hazardous materials, uh, analyses, all of those things might be attached as technical appendices. Something that's missing here, maybe you want to write it in, is project description. Now that I notice, I must have forgotten it. But there has to be, a, a, there's generally a discrete section talking about the project description as well. Yes? Uh, under the project alternatives, mm -hmm. are the, the differences in the impacts that are, um, that come from having an alternative be the chosen project uh, outlined? In other words, the difference in the traffic, the difference in various elements that have to be measured. Right, yeah, so the, the uh, level of detail required for alternatives analysis is less than the level of detail required for the project itself. The city, however, is going to look at the uh, community-derived alternative at the same level of detail as, as the project. So that one, it's going to be very clear, You're going to, very easy to see. Uh, in other cases, what happens generally is that there is uh, less level of detail, but enough detail to be able to compare across alternatives. So that you know that alternative A is going to have this level of impact. Alternative B uh, is going to be better in these areas, worse in those areas, the same in these areas. Uh, so that you'll be able to compare across them and also be able to compare the alternatives with what the project would do. So you're able to, to weigh the differences, the pluses and minuses of the alternatives as well as the project. Let's see what else about the alternatives. I guess it's about, oh, then you always have to include a no project as the alternative, as another alternative. So it's a mandatory no project alternative. And then other alternatives, a reasonable number of them uh, that the uh, lead agency has decided to include. A reasonable number, there again, no, no set standard. It's not five alternatives. It's not one alternative. It's not 15 alternatives. Uh, it's a reasonable range of alternatives. It doesn't have to look at every alternative in the world. It has to have a reasonable range. So public involvement pops up and the notice of preparation, the review period, the draft EIR review period, uh, 120 days this time. And then uh, meetings, there are going to be planning commission meetings, so you can be involved then. City council's hearings, same thing. Uh, you can submit written comments, verbal comments. Uh, and then the city has to consider all of them that, that are provided on the EIR before it takes action on the project. It only has to respond in writing to those that came in during the draft EIR period, but it also has to consider those that come in after the draft EIR period. So even if you miss, you know, turning your, your 
comments in, you're, you're done on day 122, uh, you can still turn those in. It may be that you won't get a written response, but the city uh, council, at least, will have to consider those before they make their decision. Let's see what else. So EIR considerations. So we have something called the environmental setting. Uh, essentially, every one of these resource areas, everything from aesthetics and air quality to public utilities. You want to take a break? I'm thinking is maybe it, a five-minute break. Is that the official signal for break, this, doing this? I like that. That's better than time out, eh? It is. Okay. All right, do you want to take about a, a five-minute break? Is that long enough? Yeah. Okay.
say 10. No, I think we'll, we'll hopefully get out of here by 10.30 or so. <laughs> no, 9.30 is what I mean, not 10.30. So, okay. All right, so uh, looking at the environmental setting of the baseline, uh, we're looking at what are significant impacts. Significant impacts are basically a substantial change, a substantial adverse change in the physical impact or physical uh, environment. So substantial adverse change in the physical environment, that's measured by what's out there right now, baseline, versus what would be there with the project. So this, this amount here in between, that's the change. And is that sub a substantial change? That's the, the key question. If it is, then we consider that to be a significant impact. So environmental setting is going to vary depending on the resource. Uh, some resources it will have a smaller environmental setting than others. For example, air quality, generally their environmental setting is the basin, the air basin. So it would be the entire Bay Area. Uh, traffic is going to be smaller than that. It's going to be the, the roads directly surrounding the project as well as those roads uh, within a relatively reasonable area of distance from the project that are directly affected by the project or that are going to get some indirect effect because of uh, traffic generated by the project. So that's going to be relatively small or smaller. Air quality is going to be relatively bigger. But the setting is going to vary depending on the resource. And then um, I guess one thing to also include is something called the regulatory setting. In other words, uh, what regulations apply to the project? So the EIR will generally have the environmental setting for that particular issue, whether it's air quality. Uh, and then it will have the regulatory setting. So we'll go through the, the air quality requirements of the Federal Clean Air Act, uh, the State Clean Air Act, the requirements of the San Francisco Bay Area Air Quality Management District. Uh, all of that sort of stuff will be discussed in the regulatory setting. The idea for having a regulatory setting is that it gives some context for the potential impacts on the environment. In some cases, it can provide the standards that provide us a threshold of significance. In other cases, it may have uh, requirements that the project has to meet that would go about reducing some of the project's potential impacts. So generally the regulatory setting is thrown in there uh, to give us some context for the impact analysis. Uh, CEQA says the environment or CEQA guidelines say the environmental setting is normally existing conditions, uh, but that can vary. Normally is intended to give flexibility to the lead agency. And in some cases that may mean uh, taking an average of activities over a period of time. Uh, it may mean uh, not using the existing conditions right now when the application comes in and the environmental analysis starts, but those six months from now when it's flowering season so that you know what the botany is on the site. Because if we use technically used existing conditions at the time the environmental analysis begins and it began in the winter, you're not going to find anything on the site. But if you go out in the spring or the summer, it may be that now things are blooming and you'll be able to find what sorts of plants are there. So it's not going to be necessarily an instantaneous moment, but it could be um, a particular period of time where you've got uh, you know, growing seasons, that sort of thing. It may be something where you're averaging uh, things, where perhaps it's water flow through an area where you would average water flow, you'd average out the water flows. Uh, it could be something where you use the maximum that has occurred in the past, where it's, for example, flooding. Uh, you'd use the maximum flooding level as your baseline. Uh, so it varies depending on the particular situation. Uh, one thing that the courts have told us in the last few years is the baseline can't be hypothetical future conditions, uh, meaning it can't be something that um, is well off into the future that probably will never occur. Uh, there was a court case in Southern California with the South Coast Air Quality Management District uh, considering permits for an existing refinery. Uh, the existing refinery is going to be changing its processes so that it will be able to produce low sulfur uh, diesel fuel. The idea being that low sulfur diesel fuel would help clean up the air in Southern California uh, and all that sort of good stuff. The Air Quality Management District used as their baseline the maximum permitted level of emissions for the refinery. The problem with that as a baseline was that the refinery had never actually produced that maximum level, and it physically was unable to do so. The refinery had a set of three boilers, and there were permits for each of the boilers. Uh, each boiler would have to be operating at full capacity in order to, meet, or in order to uh, emit the emissions that were permitted under this, this blanket permit. Uh, in reality, they couldn't run all three boilers at once, and so it was literally impossible for them to ever reach that permitted level. 
And so when the California Supreme Court looked at it, they said, you can't use that permitted level as your baseline. We're not going to say you can't use some permitted level or some average or some maximum, but if you've never reached that level, and if it's physically impossible for you to reach that level, that is a hypothetical future condition, and that's not the baseline. Okay? So the baseline can be these various different things. It could be existing conditions. It could be perhaps a, a, an average of conditions over time. Uh, it could be a maximum condition that's occurred at some point in time. Uh, it, there's even a court case where it was the maximum permitted uh, amount of traffic uh, that was used as a baseline and, and was upheld by the court and also cited by the Supreme Court as being a good example. Uh, so it can be those sorts of things, but it can't be a hypothetical future condition. Now, we have a new line of court cases where there's, again, a split between Southern California and Northern California over traffic projections. Uh, traffic projections are kind of, in some ways, kind of different because in most cases, uh, if a, it's going to be several years until a project is built. And so when it starts actually generating traffic uh, is not right now. And so com the argument is, is that comparing existing conditions to the uh, conditions at the time where the traffic is being produced uh, creates kind of an artificial situation because there may be improvements, street improvements that are put in. Uh, there may be other projects in the area that are contributing uh, traffic to the road, so the road conditions may change. So if you've got five or ten years between the time the project is considered for approval and the time it actually starts generating traffic, uh, there can be some changes in the way things go. And so that's been the argument. Uh, there are a couple of court cases down in the city of Sunnyvale where the court essentially said, we're not buying that argument. And we think that existing conditions means existing conditions. And so that means it could be an average and that sort of stuff, but it's not going to be anything beyond the time the project is approved. That's going to be your traffic baseline. On the other hand, we have a court case in the South Bay where they've held that uh, existing conditions, normally existing conditions, that could mean something as late as project opening day. So instead of being at the time of the project, uh, actually, at the time of, uh, I should say, at the time of when you begin analyzing the impacts, the baseline would be the time the project opens. So it might be a year, two years from now. Okay, question? I do. If there's going to be nine different uh, developments, uh, each which has a suggestion of anywhere from 4,000 to 10,000 residential homes in the uh, area around the project. Uh, and these are supposed to be slated to be built somewhere between now and 30 years from now. That, And we're looking at traffic studies. Would the Sunnyvale one? I, I, I don't understand that. Yeah, good question. Yeah, so how do you look at those? And that's the $64,000 question. Because in Southern California, uh, the courts have said you can look out 30 years. You could look 30 years into the future and use a 30-year future um, projection that's available from, in that case, it's the South, Southern Co California Association of Governments, but it's like MTC or ABAG here. You could use their traffic projections as your baseline, even though their traffic projections are, I think they're either 2030 or 2035. And so we have a court case down there saying that. And then we have the Sunnyvale case where they're saying, well, no, no, it can't be any farther than the time at which the project is approved. And then we have a later case in Sunnyvale, a Pfeiffer case, uh, where they took what I think is a kind of a reasonable approach. And they said, well, why don't you look at the time the project opens and you know, give us some background as to what the, what the traffic uh, conditions might be at the time the project opens and compare that to project opening day with the project versus project opening day without the project. And that would be the difference that we'd be looking at. Okay? I don't see how people can work, uh, uh, even figure out an EI under it. Right. Are under these circumstances. Yeah, good question, yeah. Yeah, that's... a planning commission. That's the... That's the issue, that's the thing. And I think what many, what many are doing these days is because of the, the Sunnyvale case, they're providing both. They're providing a comparison. It's not, I don't know if you know what the traffic, they're going to do both probably, right? What, what most um, consultants are doing now is they'll provide you with an analysis of existing conditions today versus exist, uh, existing with project, 
And then they'll also take a look at some future time when project opens, and it'll be traffic without project at project opening day uh, versus traffic with project at project opening day. Okay, and you'll have both of those to look at, and that's what you use for the EIR. It's kind of a, it's a confusing, it's a confusing situation. It's confusing for us too as consultants. Yes. This is. I was going to ask the same question, but I have to follow up. There's no way you can do an EIR with, you know, considering without considering the impacts of the 10 to 20 thousand units of new housing coming into San Francisco, you know, <laughs> and and the traffic impacts. I mean, it has to be considered going out 30. Right, years. and they will be. They will be considered as part of the cumulative impact analysis. So besides what we have here, the environmental setting and the impact analysis, there's also something called cumulative impact analysis. And that analysis is, well, what's the cumulative uh, traffic problem within the region that this project will be contributing to? And so that, the way that that's done, it's pretty clear. That's projected out into the future, uh, generally using accepted uh, regional planning for what future traffic will be. And then you compare your project and what it's producing for traffic to this this projection of what's going to occur, and you determine whether or not your project is going to make a, a significant contribution to that future cumulative uh, thing. And cumulative means the contributions of past, present, and reasonably foreseeable future projects. So CEQA does cover that, but it, it kind of covers it in a slightly different section uh, or discussion of the uh, in the EIR. Okay, so it looks at project impacts, and then it looks at projects' contribution to cumulative impacts. Okay, so what's happened is, well, what is happening with the Southern California case is that the court in that case is kind of melding the two analyses together. So again, we'll have to see how that works out. Right now it's a split in the courts, and Northern California courts are doing it one way, Southern California courts are doing it another way. Both are precedent. Neither one has to, ta has to take the other one's approach. Neither set of courts have to take the other one's approach. Even though they're precedent, that just means that they can be argued in another court. But it's still up to that court to decide on the basis of the facts before it whether to follow that precedent or whether to go its own way. Okay? So, unsettled. Unsettled. So, if you see a couple of different baselines when you're looking at the traffic analysis, that's why. Because we have this split in the courts and we have the Sunnyvale court case the Pfeiffer case that came after it that allowed a little more leeway, and then uh, the, I um, can't remember the name of it. Anyway, it's a metro rail case down in Southern California uh, in the Los Angeles area where it is lots of leeway being suggested by that court. Okay. So uh, CEQA requires that the ER look at a range of alternatives. So they have to look at a range of reasonable, potentially feasible alternatives as well as the no project alternatives. There's no particular number of alternatives, no magic number of 5 or 85 or uh, 1 or 3 or anything like that. Uh, but the alternatives that are selected have to meet most or all of the project objectives, and they have to substantially reduce one or more of the significant impacts, except for no project, because that one is mandatory. You always have to look at that. Whether it meets any objectives, whether it reduces any impacts, you always have to look at no project. Yes? Yeah, so what do they mean by meet most or all project objectives? The project description will lay out the, the objectives of the project. And so each of the, these alternatives will have to meet most of those objectives, uh, and, or all of them. You know, they'll have to, but they'll have to be essentially be attempting to do the same thing, meet the same purpose and need as this project does, uh, but in a different way. And different way could be a different configuration, a different mix of uses, um, that sort of thing. The description that well, all of this is written by the lead agency. Lead agency has to be satisfied that the project description meets its needs, and the objectives as well reflect the objectives of the lead agency. Now there may be, they may have the same objectives. It may be the applicant and the lead agency have the same objectives, but the objectives that are in the EIR are to be those of the lead agency. Okay, and now, uh, oops, yeah, so there'll be generally in the analysis of the alternatives, the alternatives chapter will generally have uh, 
a number of alternatives that were considered that aren't included for analysis in the EIR. So it will discuss those. Or in some cases, the agencies attach it as an appendix. But somewhere in the document, there'll be a discussion of these other alternatives that we looked at, and for one reason or another, we discarded them. Uh, they didn't meet most of the objectives. Uh, we looked at them, and what do you know, they're worse in every aspect than the project as far as environmental impact. Uh, we looked at them, and it's clear that they're not feasible. Uh, and so for any one of those three reasons, you can set aside uh, these other alternatives. And so the EIR will not only describe, let's say, three alternatives, no project, whatever this community-derived one is, uh, another one besides that, I forgot what the name of the other one is, but I think it has three, right, something like that, three, four. Yeah, there we go, renewable energy. So there's three in this case. Uh, there may be others that they looked at, and so those will show up somewhere in the EIR in the appendix or somewhere in the documentation, and it'll explain why those, those other ones weren't carried forward for additional analysis. And a question. Uh, Thank you for um, your patience. Yeah, I don't know how to word this exactly. I'm not good at this stuff, but do you look at the, does the EIR look at only the effects just in the general area, or does it look at the effects like on the ABAG level or the state level, like in terms of, say, traffic, that it's important to, to build housing and uh, workplaces near each other, and that kind of thing? And, you know, does it look at that, or is it just, you know, right here? Yeah, that's a good question. CEQA is pretty much project oriented. So it tends to be, right, it tends to look at the project and what the project's impacts will be. However, uh, some, some environmental effects are regional in nature. Now, traffic is not regional, but on a gigantic project or a big project, I should say, like this one, yeah, it's going to have a regional, it's going to be more than just Brisbane, in other words, that's affected by traffic. It's going to affect traffic up into the city. It's going to affect traffic to the south. Um, I don't know if it'll reach all the way to the San Mateo Bridge, but it's going to affect traffic within a regional area. You know, more than just one city, it's going to be two, three, four cities, uh, as well as a couple of counties. You know, so you, you can have regional aspects that you're analyzing in your EIR. But it just depends on the project. Depends on the project. Now, it's not uncommon for uh, traffic analysis, for example, these days, uh, to look at a, a sort of a balance that may be occurring within the project between jobs and housing and taking that into account. Well, you know, they're going to have stores nearby. There's going to be housing uh, nearby, uh, some jobs nearby. There's going to be, uh, I don't know, bicycle lanes provided. Uh, so perhaps internal circulation, there might be less internal traffic within this project than might be expected of a, of a project that doesn't have that mix. Um, you know, so those things may be taken into account in the analysis itself. Okay, so some of those those sorts of big big picture issues might be picked up in the analysis too. Uh, Terry, one of the things sometimes in uh, evaluation against regional plans and policies, mm -hmm. and that kind of pick up there too. Right, that's a good point. Yeah, so maybe consistent. Well, if assuming an A bag, yeah, you know, whatever they do with their their strategy, their communities, their sustainable community strategy. Yeah, so there, there is an aspect also of analyzing how this project fits in with regional plans that may be, uh, you know, may be pertinent to it. So there'll be some discussion of that too. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So the city, the EIR is supposed to identify the environmentally superior alternative, but the lead agency isn't required to adopt that. It's simply uh, there for the purpose of again providing information to the decision makers that amongst the alternatives. This one is actually the nicest of, of, of the alternatives we're looking at. Okay, it doesn't necessarily, uh, it might be still worse than the project in one way or another, but, or worse than some of the other alternatives. But overall, this one would be the nicest of the alternatives. And then the city, if it chose to do so, could ap approve an alternative rather than the project. CEQA doesn't require that it deny the project or that it approve the project, uh, but it would also potentially allow it to adopt one of the alternatives in place of the project. And we talked about significance, talked about feasible, fully enforceable mitigation measures. One has to be adopted for each significant impact unless they're infeasible. Do you have a question or a comment? I think there's a question related to the discussion on significance. <laughs> um, I think there's a question related to the discussion on significance. The impacts that would be felt on a regional basis. Ah, mm -hmm. 
there's a whole different way to look at that, and, but I don't think there's an agency that takes care of it. And that is, how about the, the impact of this regional project on the overall deterioration of the quality of life in terms of air quality, water quality, capacity? In other words, there's a, I guess it's, the underlying is that there may, be a, there may be a carrying capacity issue that each one of these projects gets us closer to that from which we want to come back, and it, because it will be too far. And a, a related question I had is that I went to a conference, and the delta that was formed out in the Pacific Ocean off the coast of San Francisco, instead of dumping inside of the area where the bays were dumped by, uh, by Alcatraz, and they had stopped that, and that delta, at this conference, they discussed the possibility that that delta that is formed by those tailings it may be causing the erosion of the Pacific coast by uh, San Francisco and San Mateo County. This is improvement. But that's an example of a project, EIR, that might have been done, that if they'd known what was going to happen or potentially happen, they would have never done the project because it's a it's a significant impact that they may never be able to change. Now that they've dumped all that, they've changed the, the shape of the ocean bottom and and uh, and changed the way the waves come in. And I, I guess it's it just this is a this is a, a comment of frustration. <laughs> but if you know of any kind of an agency that or uh, effort that's being formed to measure things in terms of how much how much are we deteriorating everything by each project? Because I think that, that uh, my friend Danny here has talked uh, often about, you know, like just another smidgen of mercury in the day <laughs> on top of all those other smidgens. And, and we may get to the day with supercomputers that we can actually figure this out. And it's kind of like, will we ever use that knowledge to benefit the future residents of California so that we haven't screwed it up so much that they can't fix it? Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's, that's another way, instead of thinking of, of the regional balance of housing and jobs, uh, you know, as being uh, the only issue, there are many issues. That mm -hmm. are Certainly issues. are. Yeah. Right. And Seek was poorly designed to do that. Seek was not really designed to do that at all. Seek was very project oriented. So Seek was looking at each individual project as it pops up in time. Uh, even though it has this component where you're supposed to be looking at cumulative impacts, and cumulative impacts are the effects of past, present, and reasonably probable future projects, you can, uh, you can only go out so far as to what those reasonably foreseeable future projects are. And that's a very imperfect science. And so you tend to end up with these analyses that aren't very accurate in, in looking at, at the cumulative impact. We have some uh, regulatory programs that are, do, that are attempting to do that, that, you know, was a total, total maximum daily load programs for water quality, uh, that sort of thing, uh, where they're attempting to regulate the amount of mercury or other contaminants that are going into uh, surface waters. Uh, but there aren't a lot of, there isn't a lot of that going on. Uh, there's a lot of, um, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, there's a lot of uh, projections and those things that go on with traffic, but uh, you know, some of those are done with rose-colored glasses on, so you don't really know how accurate those, those things are. Yeah, but it's not something that's very well covered by CEQA at all. So it's really a shortcoming. But again, it gets back to the fact that CEQA is over 40 years old and hasn't had a, a major overhaul uh, probably since 1970. I mean, since 72, I should say. Uh, hasn't had a major overhaul for decades. And they'll may, well, every so often the, the legislature will say, oh yes, we've overhauled CEQA, we've you know, reformed CEQA, but the changes are superficial at best. and really haven't made much in the way of changes in these basic areas. Uh, let's see what else. Um, yeah, fully enforceable blah, blah, blah. We talked about what's significant, what can be significant. So again, CEQA doesn't specify particular study methods, but we have methods that are based on professional practice recommended by responsible agencies, required or indicated by other laws. A lead agency gets to select the study method, but it has to do a good faith effort at uh, disclosure, and so it's going to be looking at these things, professional practice, methods that it, responsible agencies are suggesting. Uh, other laws may have requirements that, in, that indicate what should be done. Um, and then if there are competing opinions, 
coming from competing studies, the EIR is, is supposed to disclose those, at least the final EIR is supposed to disclose those. The idea of there being, um, you know, opposing expert opinions. Now I hope everybody's happy that it's cold enough in here. <laughs> like I said, cumulative impacts we talked about. Yeah. Cumulative impacts, as we talked about before, it's the uh, collective contributions of past, present, foreseeable, future actions. Classic ones are traffic, air quality, uh, climate change through greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, those are all classic cumulative impacts where we've got a whole bunch of little activities occurring. None of the little activities by themselves are significant, but when you take them all together, you know, we have bad air quality, we have climate change occurring, uh, we have all these other things that are happening because of these little activities that are occurring. And so EIR is going to look at it in one of a couple of ways. One is to try and put together a list of these uh, probable future projects or to uh, look at plans and projections that will give us an idea of what this cumulative universe looks like. And there will be several cumulative universes. Each resource area has its own cumulative impact analysis. Resources uh, such as air quality, cumulative impacts for air quality are going to be different than those for traffic. And so the uh, EIR tries to determine whether or not the contribution is considerable, in other words, whether it's significant when looking at this cumulative context. Uh, and so even though the project's impacts by themselves might be less than significant, nonetheless, the project might still have a significant cumulative contribution. Okay, does that make sense? Because lots and lots of small things add up to something big. Even though our project is contributing a small thing, its contribution is adding to this big thing and therefore might be significant. So a different way of looking at the impacts, it's CEQA's imperfect approach to try and look at this bigger picture to the extent that it can. Uh, then we have the mitigation measures. Uh, what we talked about, they have to be sufficiently detailed and they have to be uh, effectively implemented, so on and so forth. And the EIR isn't required to mitigate everything below a level of significance. As I mentioned before, we have that statement of overriding considerations that could allow a project to move forward even though it has significant unavoidable impacts. And we also have the findings where an agency could explain why the mitigation measures are infeasible. So uh, you don't necessarily have to mitigate every impact below a level of significance if it's not feasible to do so. But the agency has to explain why it's infeasible. Uh, let's see what else. We've already talked about this performance standards, objective criteria, etc. Oops, come back here. So we have technical data. Technical data can be summarized in the EIR and then the appendices attached. The EIR is intended for uh, the average person to be able to read and understand. So if there's uh, detailed technical information, the CEQA guidelines provide that you can uh, put that into an appendix or otherwise make it available to the public and then summarize it uh, in the EIR. Uh, one thing that uh, sometimes agencies fail to understand is the, uh, what's called incorporation by reference. CEQA allows you to incorporate information by reference, but that doesn't mean that you simply refer to it. Uh, it means that if you're going to incorporate it by reference, that you have to summarize what the information has to say. If it has particular um, conclusions, you have to summarize those conclusions uh, and all of that. So incorporation by reference means more than just referring to it. It means, uh, you know, this, the discussion in, uh, I don't know, the EIR for um, the 123 project is hereby incorporated by reference. That's not enough. It's hereby incorporated by reference, and here are the basic conclusions made in that report relating to this particular subject, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That would be how it's done. Okay. Uh, then the mitigation monitoring and reporting program. If the project is approved and it has mitigation measures, then the agency is requ required to adopt a mitigation monitoring and reporting program. And the purpose of that is essentially to implement, make sure I should say, the mitigation measures are implemented by the agency uh, and that they're done. Each responsible agency adopts a mitigation monitoring program for the mitigation measures that are its responsibility. So you have a series of mitigation monitoring programs that will be adopted for a project, one for the lead agency and one for each one of the responsible agencies. Question? Thank you. Um, there, there's a, there, under the technical data, one of the oh. things you say is that the Go lead back. agency is not expected to undertake original research right. during the IR. And, and one of the, one of the um, things that we pointed out 
or, or one of the comments made in Stokely was, for example, that there's not enough information about, say, the lagoon. What's in the, you know, what's, what's, uh, what kind of contamination actually exists in mm. there right now? Mm -hmm. um, it's expected to prevent, uh, present available information, including conflicting expert opinions. So does that, does that, so they wouldn't be expected to do a biological survey? Survey right, they would be they would be expected to do a biological survey to the extent reasonable. But what I mean is that they wouldn't uh, necessarily be required to set Albert Einstein working in a laboratory or Thomas Edison working in a laboratory uh, to come up with something or unique and original. Uh, you but could, might, you, but, but, they might be but you could hire additional exactly. You would hire consultants who would go out and do sampling because okay. one of the things that you're required to do is describe the baseline, right? And so the baseline would include what are the conditions, what are the, the existing conditions uh, within the surrounding area that might be affected by the project. And if there would be run potential runoff from the project that would enter the lagoon, well, you need to know what's there in the lagoon right now to be able to determine whether or not that additional runoff would create an impact on the lagoon. Okay, so they, they're required to do studies, analyses, that sort of thing, uh, but they're not necessarily required to go out and reinvent the wheel. Uh, and they're also not required to um, to uh, speculate as to what what things might be required. They can project, but they're not required to speculate. Yes. <laughs> uh, thank you. Several times you said uh -huh. uh, that the lead agency had to commit to the mitigation of right. the reporting plan uh, program. Could you describe what you meant by Right, they have to adopt the mitigation monitoring and reporting program, and then they're obligated to uh, follow through on it to make sure that the mitigation is being implemented. Now, one thing that they, that the mitigation, or the weakness, I should say, in the mitigation monitoring and reporting program law is that all it requires is the mitigation be implemented. It doesn't require the impl that the mitigation actually work. Uh, that's not something that's specified in the law. So. That means that the environmental impact report needs to have good mitigation measures, mitiga mitigation measures that lay out exactly how things are going to be done. And if it's one of those situations where maybe there's going to be uh, rehabilitation or something that may take a period of time, that mitigation measure should talk about it taking a period of time and what sorts of monitoring activities might be part of the mitigation itself. A monitoring can occur, for example, when you're doing um, uh, you know, restoration work that sort of thing. So as you would go out and you would uh, put in your restoration plantings uh, and perhaps come back in three months, see how they, well they've survived. Uh, and if they fall below a certain level of survival rate, then you'd plant some additional ones. If it appears that's not working, then your mitigation measure would uh, call for some, uh, you know, some adaptation to occur so that you would change your approach. Uh, so the mitigation should lay out all of those things. Uh, rather than relying on this mitigation monitoring and reporting program to do that. Because its purpose is simply to ensure implementation. Whereas the mitigation measures are supposed to be uh, written well enough that they can be implemented and effective. Yes. Um, yes, I wanted to know if one of the mitigation measures could be something to the effect of suggesting the order of development or like... Um, um, Mary was referring to um, not proceeding until you've had an adequate study of X, Y, or Z. Um, is, is that typical of a mitigation measure? Because, um, it, pardon me for being cynical, but some of us have sat through years of this process and we come to um, uh, the, when seeing the development or the, the actual project taking place and we have a city a attorney stating, oh, well, we can't enforce that obligation. We can't enforce that measure. It was never enforceable to begin with. So I don't want to put a lot of weight into the mitigation measures if ultimately they're not um, enforceable. Um, but I would also like to hope that they would give sufficient um, um, structure so that things would happen in a way that a development wouldn't occur and then a cleanup occurs later and we discover that people are Im impacted by the uh, cleanup later. And that's, th that's my question about 
suggesting the order of development that um, yeah the, there's nothing that would prevent the city from that from doing that from uh, requiring a certain phasing you know to be phased in a particular way or that some areas develop before others uh, that sort of thing they could certainly uh, provide some sort of a timing scheme for, for the effectiveness of the permits that they issue. You know, this won't this won't take effect until such and such, pre, you know, some uh, uh, pre prerequisite is completed or something like that. Certainly, that's within the realm of possibility for for mitigation measures. And you know, I don't know enough about this project to say whether it would work here, but it's certainly within the realm of possibility. And I've seen projects where that's been done. One thing that an agency has to be careful of when they do that is that it doesn't appear as though they're deferring analysis. Because I think, I think it was today, hmm, anyway, or either today or Saturday, uh, I mentioned that you can't defer analysis. So, you know, it, it's not a, a situation where you, you would say, well, you know, we're going to require phasing, and we're not going to look at that other stuff or come up with any mitigation measures because that's going to be covered later. They can't do that. Uh, but they could say, you know, we're going to require that this be done, and the mitigation measure is going to include that until such conditions are reached, that development would not occur, or something along those lines. That's certainly within the realm of possibility. Because you have to avoid deferring mitigation. Can't, can't do that. Is there a value in putting in a mitigation measure something that relates to a responsible agency's regular work, such as uh, when you have a toxic contamination, the EPA standard is that every five years, they take a look. And in that look, that's where they find out maybe that something is no longer there that was there, or new things are there. Do you, or, or should you include like a, a reference that um, in, in the five years after, after the development uh, is approved, Yeah, the, to an extent, it's it's pretty much left up to the responsible agencies. The city can't tell the responsible agencies what to do, because they don't have authority over the responsible agencies. So it's it's going to be up to the responsible agencies to do that. Now, the this and the mitigation monitoring program, assuming the mitigation measure is is the responsibility of the responsible agency, it's going to be their mitigation monitoring program that's going to be in effect, not the city's. Because the city's mitigation monitoring and reporting program only covers those mitigation measures that are the city's obligation. Okay, so when you look at the, all the mitigation monitoring programs that would be adopted for a project of this type, they're going to be, hopefully, if all works out right, uh, they, there will be uh, adjoining, kind of adjoining boards in a fence, rather than being a con one continuous fat wide board. watch over all this because the um, city of Brisbane doesn't have sufficient staff to do that. And the coordination, and, and between DTSC and the Regional Water Quality Control Board themselves, they don't coordinate very well. So if you have something, uh, some kind of a body that is keeping track of all the city's uh, conditions, all the mitigation measures, and keeping it all together so that anyone, whether responsible agents or lead agency, knows what the heck's going on, Otherwise, how would anybody know what was going on? I mean, is that, is that a common practice in a complicated project, a large project? Yeah, good question. Um, I don't think it is a common practice. I don't think it is. Now, there are some large projects. One that pops to mind is March Air Force Base down in Southern California, where they actually created a joint powers authority. And so they have a number of agencies that are essentially cooperating through a joint powers authority to do that sort of thing. But that's quite rare. You, you really don't see that. And that joint powers authority, I think it's mostly, I think it's cities and county. Uh, so it doesn't involve the whole, you know, kind of Christmas tree of, of agencies, but rather kind of agencies that are on the same level. You know, so it, it's pretty rare. It's pretty rare. And why is it rare? Well, because... <coughs> There are, there are existing lines of authority that are out there, and creating another agency doesn't necessarily obligate any of these lines of authority to, to go in a particular direction, uh, because it doesn't necessarily have any powers 
over over those other over those other agencies. Uh, so I think that's probably why we haven't seen it. Plus, the, it costs money, and there's not a whole lot of money in public agents available to public agencies these days. So. And the project could pay, sure. Yeah, but then you always run into the situation of, uh, you know, for how long? How long do they pay? And what happens if they they uh, go under or something like that? You never know. So, I guess. Are the responsible agencies also subject to lawsuits? Should they not um, take care of the mitigations that are, that are under their responsibility? Yeah, so that's a good question. So what happens if the uh, responsible agencies don't, undertake their mitigation measures, are they subject to lawsuit? Uh, they were, would be as subject to lawsuit as the lead agency would be, sure. Yeah. Uh, strangely enough, there are not a lot of reported co court cases on, uh, you know, on mitigation measures being followed up on, uh, people suing because a mitigation measure isn't being done. There are only a couple of court cases I can think of that, that pop to mind. Uh, so it's relatively rare to see. But it can be done. It can be done, particularly if if uh, you know there's a particular mitigation measure they were supposed to do, and it's clear they're not doing it, they, there have been cases where agency but have been taken to court. Yeah, there, for one reason or another, it doesn't seem to happen very often. Okay, so let's see. So we've done done with that, I think. So technical issues, brownfields. Uh, so again, CEQA is not regulatory. So there are all these other laws that are out there. Uh, CEQA requires that the EIR disclose potential impacts. Oh, question. Back a, a back a slide, or I'm, I'm anticipating a little. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, the city cannot require other agencies to take specific action. Let's say the city says, you know, I don't think DTSC's arsenic level, you know, I don't, I don't think the present arsenic level levels are adequate. Uh, the present arsenic levels are re, are are, are uh, protective of human health, and so we want to see mitigation up. You know, we want to see this level. Mm -hmm. Now the city has the has, the city has the authority to do that. Assuming they do, I, I don't know oh, offhand. Oh, oh, yeah, I don't know whether they do or not. Yeah, question. it would be. Yeah, it would be a legal question to see how far their authority goes in that area. Okay. So, okay. But this yeah. Yeah, because I, I don't know whether they, because I know they can't order another agency to do something that, that's not under their authority. Right. You know, if it was a department of the city, obviously, the city can tell its departments to do one thing or another. But once you get into another agency, they can't tell another agency to do something. Right. Um, but so they, I don't know. But they could tell, but they can tell, but they can say a project has to meet the city's own, own uh, standards. Yeah, the, I, I don't know. Yeah, because one of the questions that would pop up immediately would be, then how do we make sure that that's done? Uh, because how would we, you know, how would we enforce that? We, we would have to have city folks enforce it, I guess, because the respond if it's beyond the standard set by the responsible agency, they may not feel an obligation to just to uh, review for that level. Uh, so it creates some complications. And I, offhand, I don't know whether the city has the authority to do that or not. Yeah. So, like I say, they can't really require other agencies to do stuff. Uh, the mitigation is within each powers, each authority's power. So, in other words, things that an agency can't do, CEQA doesn't give it the power to do. It has to already have that authority inherent in its powers. Did you have a question or comment? I can just repeat what you say. You don't, don't need the... Well, I have a question. So, the environment cannot affect the project? It might. We're not saying that the environment can't affect the project. We're just saying that there have been court cases where some have argued that. Well, my question is, if you have a brownfield reuse, then that automatically is a brown uh, environmental, an environment affecting the project. Right, right. right. Well, then why would anyone want to use the brownfield for a project under those circumstances? If they, right. Know, I, Again, we're getting into what the courts have been saying, and I don't know. You're preaching to the choir. To me, the court decision in Southern California made no sense at all. Uh, what, the, what the courts in Southern California have been saying is, uh, at least a couple of these decisions, is that uh, there are other standards that apply. And because these other standards are protective of the environment, we don't have to worry about that. But as you and I know, that's not always true. Uh, sea level rise, for example, there are no standards protective of, of people with regards to sea level rise. There are no particular standards to protect us from wildfire. I mean, you have the, the um, 
fire safe setbacks where you're supposed to go out and cut everything down 100 feet from your house, but they still allow you to build a house <laughs> out on, on, in the wildfire, you know, uh, wild, high, high wildfire hazard areas. So, yeah, there really are no standards in many cases for a lot of these issues, but that seems to be what the court is saying in Southern California. So that's, that's the issue. But here, um, obviously, we are requiring that, that there be an EIR and that it's analyzing uh, brownfield reuse and it's talking about what the potential impacts would be on human health, uh, talking about issues of risk, all of that sort of thing. So it's being done here, but there's still that open question as to whether, as how far CEQA is going to be pushed in the future. Maybe I should never have mentioned it. Okay, uh, so anything else about mitigation measures before we move on? No. Okay, so threshold again doesn't set any thresholds of significance. Uh, there are some uh, quasi thresholds, I guess, sort of. There are questions that are in the Appendix G, uh, initial study checklist in the CEQA guidelines, but those are just questions, general questions. They're not really standards. Uh, so the, the thresholds are generally set on regulatory standards, uh, some acceptable level of risk, in many cases, the lead agency is relying on the levels of risk uh, set by the responsible agencies. And then, of course, technical experts uh, hired by the lead agency uh, will recommend thresholds as well. And then the agency can rely on what the regulatory agencies say. And then also thrown in there, they may even rely on what the, the public has to say. It depends on what the, public, what the lead agency feels um, makes sense. Could you define threshold? Yeah, threshold is essentially some level at which uh, you become significant. So down here, my impact is less than significant. Uh, once my impact gets up to here, it's above my hand or above my threshold, and so now it's significant. So the, thresh the idea of a threshold is that there's some line somewhere. But in reality, oftentimes there is no distinct line. Aesthetics, for example. I mean, at what point? There's no single point uh, where suddenly something is visually obtrusive and, uh, you know, uh, if, it weren't, if it hadn't gotten beyond that single point, it wouldn't have been. And there's 15 lights over there. Jeez, it, when there were 14, it was, it was okay as far as I could tell, but now that there's 15, jeez, it, it really stands out. No, there really isn't one like that. So um, there's some areas where it's really very broad. This threshold might be kind of a broad, squishy thing, and other ones where it's more of a, of a line, a nice ink line on the paper. Uh, so some typical of analytical methods is really nothing that CEQA provides. But, you know, these are the basic things. You want to characterize existing contamination and the change resulting from the project. Human health risk, environmental risk, want those characterized. Uh, you want to recommend mitigation that attempts to bring uh, whatever impacts the project might have down to an acceptable level of risk, as that might be defined by the lead agency and by the responsible agencies. Uh, and then, of course, the, there are screening methods that both of these agencies have, have published, uh, screening approaches for environmental risk. But again, CEQA doesn't necessarily call for that, but a good faith effort at disclosure is going to include all of those things in the EIR. And the responsible agencies, uh, they're going to be considering these permits and approvals for the cleanup, remedial action plans, site cleanup orders, uh, final closure plans, uh, that sort of thing. Those are going to be off in the future, and as I mentioned before, as more information becomes known, they are probably going to trigger subsequent environmental analyses, whether it's a subsequent EIR or a supplemental EIR or a subsequent mitigated negative declaration. We don't know at this time, but they're undoubtedly going to trigger some additional analysis after this, you know, assuming this project is approved. And then there's this, what's called the rule of reason. Uh, and it's used by the courts. The courts talk about a rule of reason, meaning uh, reasonableness. Is it reasonable uh, to the level of detail in the impact analysis? Is it a reasonable level of detail? It's not reaching out into the speculative, but rather staying within things that are reasonable. Uh, is there a reasonable range of alternatives being considered? Uh, if we're deferring the details of mitigation, is it reasonable to do that? Or are, is there enough information now to have specific mitigation measures? So this is one thing the courts will apply is this sort of rule of reason. And then limits of CEQA. Uh, doesn't approve or deny the project. Leaves it up to the agency to do that. Agency is free to 
uh, approve the project, condition the project, deny the project as they wish. A uh, lead agency could approve the project. The responsible agencies can deny the project. Lead agency could approve the project with particular mitigation measures. The responsible agencies would be obligated to use the same document, but under their own authority, they may have additional requirements of that project, and they could apply additional mitigation measures or additional, at least additional conditions of approval, I should say, to the project in order to meet their uh, statutory requirements. Oops, there we go. Uh, as I mentioned, CEQA doesn't provide any new powers to an agency. So whatever authority, whatever powers it exerts right now, those are the ones that it gets to apply uh, under CEQA. Uh, let's see what else. <laughs> OK, a couple of things that limit mitigation. Of course, we talked about feasibility, being able to be completed in a reasonable period of time uh, based on uh, economic and social and legal and other considerations. And then also there's some constitutional limits. Uh, what's that? So when you say feasible, does that be feasible to the project or feasible to the CEQA getting done in a certain Yeah, so that means feasible to the project. Is it feasible for that mitigation measure to be done within a particular period of time? So this would be out beyond the EIR. Once we apply the mitigation measure, can it be done within a reasonable period of time uh, based on economic, social, et cetera, uh, factors. So one reason it would be infeasible, perhaps, is that um, you know, maybe it's technologically impossible to do this within a reasonable period of time. The technology is only to a certain point. It's going to be another 20 years before we develop the technology that's necessary. But we wouldn't have a mitigation measure that's going to leave a 20-year gap. So that would be infeasible. Okay, That would be one off the cuff. What time is it? 934 example for me. So maybe it's not the best example, but it's the best I can come up with at 934. Yes? Even though it may be infeasible, if the impact is significant, <coughs> that would be the reason that the project could be denied. Sure, yeah. So even though there's a, a significant unavoidable impact, that might be one reason to deny the project, sure. In fact, the project might have no significant unavoidable pro uh, impacts still deny the project. Portions of a project. Portions of a project. The, the city or the, uh, the agency is empowered to do what it wants as far as approving the project in whole or in part. So if it made sense to approve a portion of it, they could approve a portion of it because it would potentially have fewer impacts. The one limitation on that would be if in approving a smaller portion of it, you're now uh, potentially engendering other impacts that you didn't analyze in the EIR. That would mean that you'd have to go back and you know, recirculate the EIR, look at those other impacts, that kind of thing. Because there have been cases, the El Dorado County, for example, a number of years ago, uh, approved an EIR for its general plan, but at the last meeting on the general plan, they kind of switched around some stuff. They moved one specific plan area to another location without reanalyzing the traffic impacts. And so they thought that they were reducing impacts by moving it from where people didn't want it to where people did want it, but it changed the traffic impacts. And so the EIR was invalidated because it failed to look at traffic impacts. So that's something to consider, too. Uh, let's see, what else? Yeah, so we have constitutional limits. That basically means that uh, you're limited by what's called the nexus requirement. The impact has to be related I should say the mitigation has to be related to some impact of the project. If your project doesn't impact it, you can't, require, you can't be required to mitigate for it. And also, there has to be rough proportionality or basically a fair share that you, the applicant, uh, are paying into the mitigation or producing as mitigation. You can't be required to do more than your fair share of impact. Uh, you're not responsible for more than your fair share of impact, I should say. Okay, so there's this nexus connection between project impact and mitigation, and then also this rough proportionality, meaning that uh, there has to be a fair share of your responsibility to improve that impact. The idea is that, uh, for example, let's say that we have a crowded freeway, existing crowded freeway. Uh, this project is going to be throwing a few thousand cars onto that crowded freeway. The project is responsible for mitigating those few thousand cars and what the impacts of those are. It's not required to mitigate the existing crowded freeway or what might be even projected 
crowded freeway conditions because those aren't its responsibility. It's not, it's not causing that. It, gets to, it has to mitigate what it's causing, but not beyond that. Okay? Yes? I just wanted to know more about the El Dorado case. How did ah. they resolve that? Did they uh, send it back to the for, to redo the EIR? Yes, they portion? did. Or they had to do the whole EIR? Thing? All they had to do was that portion, yes. They all, all, only had to but do what did they do? They redid the entire EIR, uh -oh. as well as the entire general plan. They didn't have to do it. But they did. And so it took them another, I don't know, six, seven years uh, to go back and redo everything. And by the time they were done, nobody was happy anyway. But it, it took a long time for them to redo it. But they could have simply, you know, simply restricted themselves to fixing that traffic problem and then readopted the plan with the new EIR with the updated traffic analysis. And that would have been all they needed to do. But they chose to do more. I'm sure that they're sorry, too. But too bad. Uh, okay, so CEQA proceeds in advance of project design. So you don't necessarily have to have your project completely designed before you begin the CEQA process. Uh, I'm working on a project right now where it is only at 15% design. In other words, there's still 85% of the design process to be done. Uh, but they have, they know where the project's going to go. Uh, they have a pretty good idea of what the project's going to be. They're just not absolutely sure you know, where there's a bridge, exactly how the bridge is going to be built or what it's going to look like. But they know there's going to be a bridge there. You know, and they know the project footprint's like this. We know that. And so we have enough information to be able to do the analysis. So it has to be early enough to influence project design, but not so late that the agency has already committed to the project. So uh, you can have it in a proceeding in advance of full project design. In fact, it's supposed to do that. And then program EIR is not the end of the story. As you mentioned before, as the responsible agencies go about doing their business, there is going to be more information generated during that process. And it's highly likely that that additional information is going to turn up new impacts or more severe impacts that need to be analyzed through subsequent or supplemental uh, EIRs or a subsequent uh, mitigated negative declaration. So there will be additional analysis that goes along. Same thing for later activities of the city. The city uh, now goes about approving a subdivision map or uh, perhaps some sort of, uh, I don't know, infrastructure installation, maybe a drainage system installation. Anything that triggers a discretionary permit on the part of the city or discretionary action on the part of the city requires it to take another look at the CEQA process and see whether or not there's a new impact or a more severe impact. And if there is, then it has to prepare one of these subsequent documents. Okay, so the program ER is kind of the foundation, but it's not the whole, it's not the whole building. The building continues uh, forever. Well, not forever, but um, as long as we're concerned, I guess, forever. Okay, and that's it. So uh, questions, last set of questions, opportunities for questions before we all go back, pack it off, go home and go to sleep. Um, since aesthetic considerations are kind of mushy, said, mm -hmm. I don't know if said much, but anyway, um, is it possible as part of mitigation that it would be required to have a design review committee? Is that? Right, so could uh, mitigation include a design review committee? Uh, yes, you could require a design review committee, but I wouldn't necessarily call it simply mitigation because you have to make sure that the mitigation leads to something. So if you had identified impacts that were to occur, and you establish design review, you would also want to have performance standards for what that design review is intended to, to accomplish. So uh, you know, design review would be done to ensure that uh, buildings are no taller than, than two stories in height. Uh, they don't ex exceed particular mass standards. Uh, floor area ratios do not exceed some number, so on and so forth. So you'd lay out the sorts of things that that design review is intended to maintain. And that would make a pretty good mitigation measure. But simply saying, let's have a design review committee, that's probably not an adequate mitigation measure by itself. Because even though you're reviewing, it's not saying what you're reviewing for or what the intended outcome of that review is to be. And the mitigation measure, in order to attempt to reduce the impacts, it has to have some outcome that can show that the impacts are being reduced. Mm -hmm. Other questions or comments? Yes. Most of us are going to get another crack at this. 
Yeah. Um, well, everybody is potentially going to get another crack at this because there will be other uh, uh, other uh, uh, meetings. Right. The, the planning commission, the open space committee is going to have exactly. its own, and the and the and the city council. Right. So I, I don't know about everybody else, but I, and Parks and Rec as well. Mm -hmm. Park and Rec. Yep. Don't leave them out. And uh, so I don't know about anybody else, but I'm kind of full. Um, and and uh, I want to thank you. Oh, Very thank much. you. Yeah. So it was a, was it like quadruple chick chocolate cake? Is that what it was? <laughs> oh, yeah. Wait, wait, oh, we have another. Yeah. This is just a comment. I live in San Francisco, and I've been through several EIR processes. And I've asked for a primer from our planning department, something to give us guidance about the whole process. Never, nothing. I mean, this is really highly evolved process, and I, I want to commend whoever started it, John Swaki. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This, this is really good for the community to do this kind of thing. Yeah, if, if I can throw my two bits in too, it is, and it's very unusual. We, yeah. we hardly ever do this. You know, I, I put on classes all around the state, uh, all the time for all kinds of agencies. In fact, I've got a class coming up uh, a couple weeks from now for the California Energy Commission. So all kinds of different agencies, but hardly ever a class like this. So this is a really, really good idea, I think. So that everybody gets a better idea of what SEEK was all about. Because it's a complicated and sometimes kind of a stupid one, really. And it doesn't always make any sense. But that's just the way it is. And if you have a better understanding, then, well, that, that's how it works. And maybe that's what the court, maybe there's some areas that are kind of unclear. Uh, somewhere the courts have made it, seem to make it unclear. Well, that gives you a better understanding of the whole process. Um, I remember them too. Yeah. Well, first thing is a special place in, in very many ways. <coughs> yeah. So why is it the city of stars? We put stars on our houses that lit up at Christmas. Ah, okay. So as you drive by on the base where you can see yeah, sure the whole huh. stars. Oh, all that's cool. All, all those big wooden stars that you see on some of the buildings. Yeah. I asked this question on Saturday. Oh. Huh. Yeah. So those light up. Huh. Yeah. Uh, plus all but the is it? Hollywood movie stars. <laughs>